Um, <laughs> Donnie called me um, yesterday, and I go, you need money, don't you? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, need money. And I go, what, what are we talking about here? And he goes, well, I got all of the, the suspension parts that we were keeping and ref, refurbing. And then he goes, I got about, of the parts we're replacing, I got about 65% of them. And then I go, okay, okay. And he goes, he goes, I got to tell you, Matt, this is a lot more expensive than Ferrari stuff. <laughs> and I go, okay. I like right. that he tells you that after he's and sourced everything. I, yeah. You know, he doesn't I, call you and go, just so you know, we're ordering this. Is that okay? And I knew it would be. I knew it would be expensive. But he goes, this is, this is, uh, you know, I'm used to buying vintage Ferrari parts. He goes, this is really expensive stuff. <laughs> and I go, oh, Jesus, Donnie. And I go, how much do you need? And he goes, I just want you to know I'm giving you my cost on these parts. He goes, no one else would get this price. Everyone else, there'd be a markup because I got to do a lot of work to source it. But you're you. And so, you know, you pay for my labor, but I'm not going to mark up these parts for you. And I go, okay, Donnie, how much? He goes, <laughs> The good news is you have over half the parts you need now. I have over half the suspension 65%. parts. Of the suspension parts. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. And this episode is brought to you by Groove Life. Now, listen, it is 2023. Are you still using the same belt from 2003? Now is the time to update your belt game. The Groove Belt has proprietary webbing engineered with just the right amount of stretch, and Groove Life designed the world's baddest buckle that snaps using rare earth neodymium. Woo! Magnets set in an aluminum alloy. Trust me, your waist will thank you. Whatever happens to your Groove Life gear, they are here to help. With their 94-year no BS warranty, the Groove Belt is the last belt you'll ever need. And the buckle includes what they like to call stiff tech. That's a fancy way of saying there's no annoying belt flaps that need to be tucked in. The Groove Belt is good for the office the woods, the backyard, everything in between. Plus, it never needs a, to be adjusted. Just put it on and forget about it. These are incredibly high quality products, infinitely adjustable, and they really feel like they are made to last. And don't think for a second, these guys just make belts. They've got wallets, rings, watch bands, AirPod cases, and so much more. They send us that metal wallet. This thing is like indestructible. You could over, you could run it over with a car, uh, and it holds. It's got those that auto like fan out thing, like a deck of cards with your credit cards. It's pretty pimp, actually. Groove Life has gone from a side project to a company that now provides for over a hundred families. Recognized by Inc. Magazine as one of the fastest growing companies in the USA. Love it. I love made in America stuff. It's time to bring your belt game into the 21st century. Head to GrooveLife.com slash tire and use promo code tire for 20% off all Groove Life products. That's the best offer you'll find, but you have to use my code tire for 20% off your order. One last time. Go to GrooveLife.com slash tire and use promo code tire for 20% off your whole order. Also, today's podcast is brought to you by Off the Record. We love Off the Record fighting tickets for you. I know someone who works for me here at Westside Collector Car Storage just got a ticket for something real stupid. In fact, I think we're going to talk about it in this week's podcast episode. And he is using off the record. They're going to help him get these points off his record. He got a ticket for having his headlights off in the rain, in the middle of the day. <laughs> I know you're supposed to have your headlights on, but his were off, allegedly. Off the record is going to help him out get those points off the record. All you have to do is go to offtherecord.com slash TST or use code TST10 on the Off the Record app. Get you 10% off all your legal services with Off the Record. Just get the app, enter the code now, then well, you don't have to remember it later. You certainly don't want to be thinking about it when you're stuck on the side of the road with Johnny Law over there. Right? You don't plead guilty. You never plead guilty to tickets like this. It is money extraction from you. But... You go to offtherecord.com slash TST or use code TST10 on the app, and you don't have to worry about it for a very, very long time because you got a whole team of folks 
that are ready to fight that ticket on your behalf, and they will win, allegedly. All right, folks, on this episode, it's a crew show with me and Zach. I talk about the Countach and the massive bill that just came my way for suspension bits. Zach and I talk about our three favorite racetracks, the three worst cars we've ever driven, and share some of our worst car journalist moments. We also discuss uh, the epic funeral that my brother-in-law, John Stein, had, rest in peace, and how you can help by going to bethematch.com to be a stem cell donor. And what else did we talk about, Zach? A bunch of other things. Special crashes we've had. I put them on the fly. I put them on the spot there. I wasn't ready. I put them on the spot. Uh, It's a crew show on the Smoke and Dire podcast. Welcome to a crew show, uh, Thursday. We got two crew shows this week, but we had two guest shows last week, so that's just how it be. Right. Uh, and Bucky and is one appendix down this week. So yeah, we do we actually yeah. We I talked mean, about I, we talked about yeah. him being sick and being in the hospital. Like he actually had his appendix taken out. Oh yeah, in the middle of the last show, he sent he, you he a t- photo from the hospital. Yeah, and yeah. About six hours later, six hours later, a photo of him like holding his, his appendix. appendix in a jar. Yeah, I made a video for him, and I was like, dude, do they let you take a doggy bag of that? And he's like, no, they took it back after I took the photo. I was oh. like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> That's funny. So get get well, Bucky, and we'll we'll see you soon. But like, yeah, that happened. Um, my uh, my boy Eric just came through town this morning from New Orleans, and he started nice. a new beverage called Louie Louie, Mm -hmm. and apparently this is a new type of technology, cannabis-infused seltzer water, but they've they've done something, and I don't want to inaccurately describe the science, but whatever the, the cannabis in this, it's not processed in your body the way that edibles are processed. Got it. It's processed the way that smoking it is processed. Whoa. So it doesn't do that thing where it goes through your liver and it takes 90 minutes. And turns into a more And it turns thing. into a different thing. Right. He's, it's designed so that it feels more like smoking it. And the, 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 the bell curve of your effects is more like alcohol. So like. Oh, so it's like up and down in an hour, let's say. Yeah. Like okay. you're supposed to to feel it in like five or ten minutes and then it wears off like alcohol wears off you don't feel it like an hour and a half later and you don't kind of like so this is a five milligrams thc in a can and then five five more of cbd and i haven't had any thc or cbd for a while i know (laughs) but i felt like i would try this oh man and i was fucking tempted at the memorial service. I mean, we talked about John in the last show, and I hope by now a bunch of you, uh, in, uh, in honor of John or just because you're good people, have gone to bethematch.com to sign up to be a donor. Ooh. Well, that's it's kind of nice. It's got like a citrusy but almost a little spicy kind of flavor. It's the Satsuma, which is like a mandarin orange. It's like a version of an orange. It's got like, here, there's there's a little in there if you want to take a little sip. It tastes tastes, kind of nice. So we'll see if I feel five in the show. I mean, it depends on. It doesn't really taste. I I feel five if I eat a five, and I I do like once a week. So I'm curious about your tolerance. Like, I wonder what your base tolerance is like did it elevate because of the amount of training let's call it oh 100 percent right. you mean like for, but but it's been a, it's been a year and a half i'm saying so your is your baseline back to a normal person's baseline i would think so okay. a year and a half is a pretty long time i want dude i wanted to smoke that's pretty delicious i wanted to smoke weed so bad at john's memorial well that's because they were let me just talk about john john's <laughs> memorial we should all be so fucking lucky i mean let's just say that i mean this john's memorial 200 people showed up, at least. Yeah. At least. At least. Standing room only in a big room. Yeah. Um, I talked to uh, Brad. Uh, 2,000 beers were consumed. That's a lot. Two cases of wine. Two, 12, two, two, bottles of tw- two cases of 12 bottles of wine were consumed. So 24 bottles of wine. 500 White Claws. Okay. <laughs> a case of tequila. And two pounds of weed Jesus. were consumed at this. And I, when Brad texted me that someone was donating two pounds of weed, I was like, bro, even with 200 people, we can't go through two pounds of weed. Yes, you can. You actually can. Shout out to my uh, my niece, fucking Hannah. Uh, 
who is not my wife, Hannah, there's a different Hannah, who straight up took a bowl of weed and dumped it into her Louis bag. Because well, the, the bowls that were out <laughs> were cereal-sized bowls. Cereal bowls on every on table. Two on weed. every long table, one on every round table, just sitting there mm-hmm. with, you know, just out, just grabbing Papers, as rolling trays, yeah, it was take, it was take whatever you're into. Um, and people were fucking, the guy who donated those had a... A fucking real nice bong made with John's face etched into it, and people were ripping tubes. People were it was a real 2019 vibe. People were passing joints. So I won't, I don't know how many people got COVID that night. But I was I went just, down to it. I was like, I'll be bringing COVID. Let's back just probably, say it's a number you know. greater than five. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, but like. John, you know, comes from a, a, a real shit talking family and a shit talking wife and a shit talking mother and sister. And, yep. and, you know, you don't normally hear a lot of laughing at funerals. And there was a healthy mixture of laughing and crying. Um, people took shots. People took shots at the dead guy. <laughs> Dude, his mom took a shot at his dad, yeah. who was not there because he, he just was grieving too hard, which is fine. But his yeah. mom took a real nice, subtle shot, like a fucking dart. <laughs> and he's, yeah, it was really funny. I mean, it was the you know, good some good speakers. Uh-huh. <laughs> and yeah. then, and then uh, you know, they weren't, um, you know, they weren't religious. I mean, they're Jewish technically. John was bar mitzvahed, but but but. Probably hadn't been to a temple since, except to marry people. He married 13 people uh, as a non-denominational, like, internet certified. That's cool. Um, But, uh, you know, they had to find a rabbi. And so they found a rabbi in, like, 48 hours' notice. And I hate when the the, the person, the the religious person at the funeral, pretends they knew the person when they don't. I've seen that before, and it stinks. So I'm glad he didn't do that. And he, he said during the service, he said, you know, for better or worse, I've been to a lot of funerals. And he's like, but I ain't never seen one like this, which I thought was – people were in flip-flops. Everyone clapped for it. It was great. People wore their, like, what do you call the – the hoodie towel that surfers wear. Uh, like the changing uh, hoodie. Yeah, yeah. Like people wore their changing hoodies and their flip flops. Like wear. so much outer known uh, flannel. You know, it was a, a real variety of um, of a uh, of fucking uh, attire, this yeah. thing. Um, and, <laughs> and then, you know, at the end of the service, Jillian, who is uh, John's widow, uh, was like, oh shit, I forgot to bring a check for the rabbi, like, which is not. Well, that's an interesting thing to say, you know, at your own husband's funeral. It's like someone didn't take care of that already. She's like, fuck. She starts like f- kind of like freaking out, like she can't pay this guy. And I'm like, I'm like, Jillian, go over there and take a shot of tequila. I grab the rabbi and I'm like, I- I'll handle this. You don't don't ever think about this again. And you know, I go for and now I'm Venmoing a rabbi in the, <laughs> in the right after the funeral. Use your tablet to send something to his. Tablet. He's showing me the QR code, you know, and I'm like, "This is how much?" No, but I didn't. Um, but then I go, you know, hey man, uh, why don't you go out there and uh, grab a handful out of one of those bowls, you know, for the effort? And, and he goes, and he goes, "Oh, that's that's really cool of you, man. I appreciate that very much." He goes. But my brother's a grower, so I'm sorted. <laughs> and I was like, yep, we got the right rabbi. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, it was a uh, – it was it was a – and then it quickly turned into a fucking rager. They're playing Maiden and Van Halen and, and just – people are just – Pounding beers and chugging tequila, they're they're fucking blazing in the inside. Yeah, just no, not giving a fuck. It was gonna tube. be a great party. Like I didn't know anyone there aside from like you know you and Tim. So mm-hmm. I wasn't gonna stay in San Diego overnight. But anyone who did, like I bet it went till four. Oh, it fucking yeah. rage. Yeah, it ra- it was it was a rager. So uh, that's that's uh, you know as far as funerals go. It's too bad the guy it was for was dead. Otherwise, he would have had a good fucking time. Yeah, but I think it it indicated like. He probably had a lot of those parties when he was alive. Yeah, and he, he built never such a cool those, friend yeah. network by being the this magnet that everyone mm-hmm. said he was. Mm-hmm. And you know, we should all be so fortunate to do that in our entire, you know, a, yeah. a, a ninety year life. Yeah. So anyway, go to please go to be the match dot com and and sign up. It's very easy. It's totally non invasive. You might save somebody's life or meaningfully extend it. Uh, and if you're asked to donate um, stem cells, it's just a blood draw. Same as if you were giving blood. They're not drilling anybody's bones. It's you know, it's. I suppose a needle is technically painful, but other than just the needle, it's pretty. It's pretty a painless process. So, um, and please, if you can, 
donate uh, blood, platelets. Um, there is a national shortage, and uh, when John was alive, he was really going through a lot of that stuff. So, um, yeah. So anyway, long driving day on uh, Friday down to San <laughs> yeah. Diego and back. Um, but uh, yeah, um, cars, right? Folks, we got to take a quick break from the action here because we are supported by NASCAR. NASCAR is heading to the desert at Phoenix Raceway. The recent reconfiguration of this track makes for some of the most entertaining racing on NASCAR's circuit, sometimes going four or five wide. The clash at the Coliseum and the Daytona 500 kicked off NASCAR's 75th anniversary with a bang, and I'm sure we'll be treated to some more great wheel-to-wheel racing in Phoenix as well. Which drive is going to have what it takes to bring home the checkered flag and set the tone for the rest of the season. Make sure you don't miss out on the action and tune in to NASCAR Cup Racing on Fox uh, Sunday, March 12th at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, 12.30 Pacific. Fox, be there. Um, (laughs) Donnie called me uh, yesterday, and I go, you need money, don't you? (laughs) <laughs> and he goes, yeah, need money. And I go, what What are we talking about here? And he goes, well, I got all of the, the suspension parts that we were keeping and ref- refurbing, which is just like metal bits and brackets and, you know, tie rods and shit like that. Mm-hmm. that you know, we sent them out to be refinished and repowder coated. So they're like new. And then he goes, I got about, of the parts we're replacing, I got about, 65% of them. So a lot of he the bent bar whatever that uh, one of the uh, wasn't A-arms. it was it an A-arm yeah. I, it was an it was some kind of front suspension component just basically a rod yeah. threaded rod. They fixed that. They don't bend they don't heat it and bend it back. They 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 made a new one. Oh, okay. They they made a new one like it was supposed to be. Uh and they got a bunch of the ball joints. There's a lot of ball joints. Like it's not their their Heim joints. It's a, it's race car shit. So yeah. they got a bunch, but not all. And then I go, okay, okay. And he goes, he goes, I got to tell you, Matt, this is a lot more expensive than Ferrari stuff. <laughs> and I go, okay. All I like right. that he tells you that after he's and sourced everything. Yeah, you know, he doesn't I, call you. And go, just so you know, we're ordering this. Is that okay? And I knew it would be. I knew it would be expensive. But he goes, this is. This is, uh, you know, I'm used to buying vintage Ferrari parts. He goes, this is really expensive stuff. <laughs> and I go, oh, Jesus, Dottie. And I go, how much do you need? And he goes, I just want you to know I'm giving you my cost on these parts. He goes, no one else would get this price. Everyone else, there'd be a markup because I got to do a lot of work to source it. But you're you. And so, you know, you pay for my labor, but I'm not going to mark up these parts for you. And I go, okay, Donnie, how much? He goes, $13,000. <laughs> <laughs> the good news is you have over half the parts you need now. I have over half the suspension 65%. parts. Of the suspension parts. <laughs> Wait, there's you need 35 percent more parts for the suspension alone. For the suspension, alone? yeah, <laughs> yeah, God. No, yeah. And not, you haven't gotten to the engine nope. yet or anything else. Nope. Jesus. Okay. That's why I'm drinking Louis Louis THC right. beverage yeah, right now. Hoping it reduces your stress. Whew. I knew this was going to be expensive, but that's a big number for half the suspension parts at his cost. <laughs> you're just getting started. Oh yeah. Jesus oh yeah, Christ. we're getting started. Well, you're doing the main thing is suspension and engine, right? These and, are the things. Yeah, engine and the out. engine won't. It's not like the engine. It's not a rebuild, right? No, it and it the engine shouldn't need a lot of parts. Yeah. Other than that shitty water pump housing, which is a couple hundred dollars to get the right one. We, we won't need a lot of parts. It's not like we're, you know. You're not buying valves. You're not no, buying. No, uh, no, no. The know, engine is, the engine is we're, we're taking it apart, cleaning it, and resealing it. So it's gaskets mainly. We're fixing okay. gaskets. and I mean, and like, yeah. okay, even if a gasket is like, what's an expensive gasket? I have no idea. $200? When I was I mean, buying them, they were 12 bucks, but yeah. they had a cardboard and they <laughs> failed all the time. Yeah, I mean, even an expensive gasket is, is a is a. Hundred dollars, you know what I mean? It's not. We're not talking tens of thousands of dollars we in gas. Know. We don't know. We have no idea. I have no idea. It might be. It might be. It might be. It might. It could easily. <laughs> Donnie be. thought it was going to be a hundred bucks or something. Yeah, and he's yeah. Like, oh, maybe not. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. So, For, so, so there's ball that. joints. Ball joints. A new control. Well, control arm piece. Whatever it is. Like. Yeah. Uh, 
What else did they, they buy shocks and springs and stuff? We're the shocks are the, the springs were re part of the powder coating, the refinishing because okay. they, they were fine. Um, springs last like fucking forever. Uh, the shocks are, are being rebuilt, so they revalve right, them right, and right. whatever the fuck. That's apparently just as effective and and easier to deal with than finding all new ones. Yeah, I assume if the actual tubes haven't like you know yeah, rotted not or like, rusted, yeah, it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. No, it doesn't okay. matter. They're being rebuilt. So okay, mm. yeah, it's a good buddy. thing they're appreciating. The yeah, I mean that's, I mean, that's it's, yeah. it. Whatever it is, it's worth it. I mean, it's it it it, it sucks. It's like. But like this is a fucking show where we talk about cars, so like I might as well talk about this. Like, likes. <laughs> <laughs> and I got off the, to I got off the phone, start. and Hannah was like, "So, <laughs> how did that go?" I was like, "Not great." <laughs> yeah, that's expensive. I was like, "I'm gonna have to go to work today." <laughs> There's not. We're not. We don't get to take vacation for a little bit. I'm yeah. going to work today. <laughs> Someone's got to pay for this. Um, the uh, the Dodger Bond video yep. went up, right? Yeah. By the time they will hear this. By the time this is out, they will have heard if you're a, the video. If you're video. a pro driver, you will hear this possibly before the video goes up. Good point. Uh, but that's why you're a fucking pro driver. Yeah. Or a, or a, 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 a championship, a championship yeah. tier, tier. And welcome to all of you. Because there are a bunch of new are. champion yeah. tier people. If you don't know what that is, that's where you get the uh, the car review videos without ads as well. Correct. Yay. No YouTube ads and no baked in stuff. Right. No ads. Total, total premium. Um, tell me about the Dodge Bond. Because <laughs> I've seen this thing at Cars and Coffee. It's been there, everywhere. It's the only one it in kind LA. Of is. I <laughs> yeah. asked him, I was like, are you the only one? And he's like, someone's building another one now. But yeah. he was kind of the first one out of the gate. Uh he read Sam Smith's article. Sam Smith of Road and Track, where mm -hmm. he worked there. He went to Japan. He's obsessed with these things. He's obsessed with them, and in Japan they race them, yes. like properly. Yeah, I mean, it's not like a sanctioned series, but once a year there is the Dodgy Bond Grand yeah. Prix. It's sort of like the Dodgy Bond in Japan. It's kind of like the King of the Baggers here. Yeah, you know where it's like a thing that's not serious, but it's still it's still something you brag about if you win. <laughs> Yeah, you know. and it and I mean it's related to motorcycles because it started as these these people were transporting their motorcycles to the track to a bisu circuit, and of course they use these vans, and as with anything with uh, you know car nerds, they went during lunchtime they're like we should just see how the vans do around the track because that's like we've done that in production. Mm -hmm. I literally did that with my dog. I tried to drag race my dog against another dog just like him at the park. Like this is what. Car well, we did performance do. van of the year at Road you Track in 2020. Like, yeah. Everyone likes to do that. So these these people started running the vans around a Bisu circuit. And then, of course, And if you've never heard of a fucking... It, it's a it's a little racist for white people to say Dajiban. A little bit. It's not really, but it's it feels a little racist because it it's like, literally uh, how you would make fun of a Japanese person for saying Dodge van. Uh, like there, there isn't really so. a jap. There isn't really a Japanese term for this thing. So it's like a phonetic well, Japanese it's, it's because accented it's literally a Dodge van. Yeah. And so there they say like Dodge, Dodge van. van. Yeah. But because of the way they say it, it's like they call it Dodgy Pond, mm -hmm. and that's just what I, what it is. Like, I don't really I don't mean it's racist. I just mean when I say it as a white guy, I feel like I'm saying something. Oh, racist. I understand exactly what you mean, and you know I, I looked. Mean? Add it into it before I did the video a couple times. I was like, is this how everyone's saying it or just? It is, right? It it's not like, really widely considered racist, right? No, I think it's just that's what they're called. And yeah. that's like, and that's what everybody seems to refer to them as. Like, yeah. I didn't see, and I read four different articles about this, all of which were written by white Americans. Yeah. Because uh, that's who's in the car. Yeah, we're the Jane the Goodalls part. of Dajabon racing. Very much, here. very much so. And they, all of them just, it's like just that's how they're referred. Yeah. Um, and if I'm wrong, please correct me in the comments. But uh, so people started modifying them. And for some reason, well, what's cool is that they were all imported by gray market importers the same way, you know, we did with supercars in the <clears throat> 80s. And because a according to the Japanese gentleman that Sam interviewed, uh, because there's no like, it's almost like the TUV or the DMV there. They don't, they don't really have a spec sheet on what the Dodge van should look like or be. Uh -huh. So when they modify them and then bring them by for registration, they just go, 
okay. Like it's they just, just assume that's how it came in. Mm. So they have a wing on it and suspension and like exhaust and all these other things. And they just go, I, I guess that's how it was shipped in here. Yeah. Um, but they, they became popular. And for some reason, the Dodge van specifically, although the second most imported uh, American car at that time was the uh, Cavalier. Why? I don't know. I couldn't find out no why. Sense. It was just mentioned. It was like Dodge van... Cavalier it makes no and sense. Then like another, and if you're Astro in Japan band. and have access to like Toyota and Honda right? products domestically, why you would even think once about a Chevy Cavalier? I mean, that's an objectively bad car. And that's the thing. Like we want to bring in or are like are interested in you know obscure Japanese sedans, but it's usually because they're better than mm-hmm. what we had or have. But this was like, or at least like. At least as good as the ones we got here. Yeah, this is. I think this is a very good example of the. We think the grass is greener a lot of yeah. times, and objectively, it's not. I mean, I've seen in uh, in Europe a couple of times. I've I've been particularly in Monaco. I think there's something about Monaco. I don't know what it is, but I've seen some very shitty cars that were imported to Monaco. It's like, do you think they do that as a joke? I didn't have any evidence that it was a joke, and it certainly would be an expensive joke. And they weren't beaters. They were decent examples of cars that were just lame. Like, I saw a 1981 or 1982 Corvette, like the pace car one, that was over there on Monaco plates. I saw a late 1980s Cadillac with the, the tuned port injection f- transverse, right. 4.9 front wheel drive. My grandma had one, and it was like a pretty shitty car, hmm. but it was in decent shape and over there. And with Monaco plates, yeah, it wasn't yeah, yeah. driven in from Italy no, or something. No, no, wow. yeah, it was weird. And I, I was, a couple other cars that were like that, that was just random American medium garbage from the 80s. I wonder though if like if someone in Maybe the eighties, like hipster kid is doing it ironically. <laughs> may, either that, or someone in the eighties who lived in Monaco went to America and they're like, "Wow, the cars here are so big and comfortable. We don't have this coming from mm. Italy or France." And they brought it over, like the S class. Like uh, but but, but it, yeah, but again, going like back to the have grass like is greener. They seven wanted, series or S classes, but they wanted to be different. I guess. So they went with Cadillac. I guess. I don't. And then and now it's gotten handed down to a grandson. Right. You know, Charles Leclerc. That's who's driving that around. Charles Leclerc. He, he's driving around <laughs> in this '80s Cadillac. That would be the G-est shit so ever. That would be so funny. If you wanted to roll stealth, in uh, on Dayton's. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be so funny. On Dayton's. I hope it's him. The car would look good on Dayton's. Yeah. Most wouldn't. things look pretty good on Dayton's, actually. Most things that are slow, I think, look slow good. Slow and on square. Yeah. Certainly. Mm-hmm. G bodies or Cadillacs from the 80s, they look good on Dayton's. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So back to the Dodge Bond. Sorry. So, so people, you know, they started modifying these things, and there's basically one shop in Japan, and there's like, it's like the Van Whisperer. And that's what he does. And, and you know, no one makes aftermarket parts for these, of course. Yeah. So you find an intake that might fit on the on the uh, the 5.7 or 5.9. And then um, Ferrari 360 brakes apparently, hmm. well, allegedly fit perfect. That's what was in the article. And then when I talked to the gentleman that owned the one I drove, which also had Ferrari brakes, because this, this van did. was done like, it was rad. <laughs> he had a wing built. He had uh, the rear splitter is actually two rear splitters from a Passat. The van is wide enough that he just put two next to each other. And it works. And it works. Oh, and it looks awesome. pretty good. Um, it's got six racing seats in it, like that's NRG cool. racing seats yeah, that are red. Cool. It has foam wraps. Um, the racing seat mounts in the back are rad because they bolted into the stock mount. So you can just pull the whole seat out really quickly if oh. you want to move a piano oh, or something. that's pretty cool. Yeah. So yeah. it kept a lot of the functionality of the van. Um, and then when the Ferrari brakes came up, I was like, okay, well, in the article it said these fit without a problem. And he was like, that is a lie. <laughs> it's like I had to call numerous machine shops to get a bracket made because yeah. the, the bolts on the, on the Dodge van go out, let's say, parallel to the ground, and the Ferrari mounting bolts are vertical. He's like, it was a 90-degree turn, like completely unfit for this system. Hmm. So we had to make it fit. That's one of those things it's- where it's like when I went to Italy for cooking school – they gave us a book that had written recipes in it, but then we oh, yeah. watched them make the dishes. Yeah. And we're like, uh, this says three eggs, and you clearly put six in. And our American guides, who also spoke Italian, 
told us to watch real carefully what they were doing because they d- oftentimes didn't want to give us the, the recipe, recipe so that we could make it exactly the way they did it unless we really it's like the Van Halen brown M&M's thing to see if we're paying attention it's that's why it was in there the brown M&M's thing the reason that was in the contract was because if they saw a bowl of brown M&M's in the fucking dressing room they would know that they read the whole contract and if they didn't it wasn't about the fucking M&M's it Mm -hmm. was about what else did they miss in terms of safety or lighting or sound or whatever it was a are you paying attention test yeah like putting curveballs in a job application yeah if you're a company is a good idea to see if someone read the entire thing yeah so this breaks thing might be be one of those yeah works just you can just do it yeah, but then you can't, and now you got to call the guy. Yeah, except the guy's <laughs> website is down. Yeah, and he so, charges twenty five thousand dollars to put Ferrari because it's in Japan. And you have to sh- you have to ship your van over to him, or, or you have him make the bracket. Yeah, yeah, that's just a test. It's just I always dig the scene and the attitude. And by the way. I don't know how this thing actually handled quite good. <laughs> I'm not fucking lying. It handled, I'd say, as it, good. Do they use Dodge? Does, does a Dodge have like an independent front suspension, or is there a reason that it's the, independent? I think it's because like the Ram had independent front suspension versus the F Series truck and the Silverado back in the '90s. Same thing. This was all, this was all built on Ram platform. I know. Obviously. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't. I don't. I know. I know. As of like '05 and up. They did, like the newer ones did, but I don't, I don't know. know about. And it wasn't in there. I found the actual brochure from the '90s, mm. and it was like unilateral suspension. You know, it's like a unibody on top of a ladder, so it's strong, but there's a lower loading height and all this like w- wonky stuff. Yeah. Maybe if it's if it's but a partial unibody, maybe that could. It be It is why. partial unibody, yeah. and I think he found these the right springs from something else, and just like made it work. I mean, this thing handled. I assume it's an automatic. As, oh yeah, it's a three yeah. speed, three speed yeah. with overdrive. So Ooh. you do a one two. You know, I, on the canyon. You're just one and two. One, two, D. Three feels way too fast. Like, we got into three on the downhill, and I was like, does this thing stop? And then I found out the brakes actually work. Quite and they're well. from a 360? Yeah, they're red. Yeah. They say fucking Ferrari on it. Like, really? they're from yeah, that's that. Pretty yeah. cool. It's pretty yeah, cool. That's pretty cool. And sweet. the fact that it works, it's just, it's a, it's a car. Uh, it's a trend with a real sense of humor. Mm-hmm. And like, I, they race these things, they slide these things, et cetera, et cetera. And this, this dude just, he doesn't have a handbrake in it, but he has like, there's a, um, it's got an energy racing wheel, and then I get in, and on the on the blinker stock, there's like this anodized purple bracket coming off of it. And I'm like, whoa, what is this crazy switch? And he goes, oh, it's just an extension oh. because of the NRG dish wheel. And, I, and it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, you know where I saw that? I was at uh, that Santa Clarita Cars and Coffee at Porsche Santa Clarita, which is a great Cars and Coffee, actually. I think it's the first first weekend. Saturday of the month. Yeah. Saturday, first Saturday of the month. Definitely recommend it. Great Cars and Coffee. But someone had this NSX first gen that had some super dished out you know sparco steering wheel that had like a real deep dish to mm-hmm. it and they had one of those metal like clip on blinker extensions so you could but it's like anodized really, aluminum yeah, yeah it yeah. looks really funky it's it's yeah. weird but it is but it then works. i used it and i went brilliant uh, like you don't have to reach forward anymore like we had when the, I had the, my C5 Corvette exactly. and I changed the steering wheel i had to reach in some weird ways for the blinker well and, and a thing we've noticed in i think the C8 the blinker on the right, which is for you know windshield wipers, is like let's call it two inches from the wheel, and the mm. one left is like two and a half. Yeah. And like how come these are different distances? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was just one of these little things. <laughs> yeah, that's which exactly it. That's evasive motorsports. Wow, they make that. Is that the same? Uh, I mean, they don't make it. They probably, they probably just sell just it on their website. It. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. here's another one made yeah, by. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's hilarious. It's hilarious. It doesn't look good. It looks fucking janky. I think in the right car, it's kind of cool. I but mean, you know a Dodge what? van, like, right. all right, yeah, it's part of a, a greater trend. But, like, how many cars can you actually put that on where it doesn't look fucking It looks like a bicycle lever. Yeah. I think my BMX brain from 11 years old that like loved anod- anodized, yeah. anodized shit, that's what likes this right mm-hmm, now. Mm-hmm. So that's what it looks like. Um, yeah. But, it's dude, not the thing pretty. is just a riot. Like, And then the fact that it drove pretty well, yeah. and like, it handled as well as my old Crown Vic. Like a new yeah. condition, considering I'm driving a mailbox. That's pretty cool. And you're sitting like on top of the engine. Sure. No power, really. Like 230 horsepower. Um, engine swap is in order. You put a so Hellcat hard. motor in that. You could. It's got the 5.9 Magnum in it. But yeah. there's, I don't know if you could fit a supercharger in there. Because it's, you know, it's underneath the dash. Like, right. Yeah. A blower might be tough. You might have to do like rear mount turbos. 
I think so. those things because he the opened through. the engine compartment and I like it's looked like, in. It's I was like, in I can really car. film this thing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah you couldn't. <laughs> if you had to do an intake manifold or like headers, fuck it. I mean, subframe. It's a, off, I assume like, it's like stock motor, basically. right? Yeah, 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 it is. It's and it's here. It, you, it has a five point nine. It's a hard. That engine though, I mean, those were decent motors. Remember the mm -hmm. Grand Cherokee five point nine from yeah. like ninety seven, ninety eight. It was like pretty fast for you know for what it was yeah that was it was a good one this it, this thing was fun it was a riot and i just and the attention to detail of like stickers here and like a sushi uh he had foam over the bars in the back seats that were covered in a wrap with sushi on it because he has kids that don't want to bang their knees on those bars what, what like, bars oh so between the racing seats you know because it's not a bench anymore it's right. two seats so the the structure that oh, holds the, the, the seats rails. that's mounted to yeah, the rails. Seat, they go all the they way across. across. So you would, just, uh, you would destroy your shin. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. not good. It was a good time. Cool. Yeah, it sounds cool. It was a good time. Yeah, that's a good, that's a that's a, that's a morning well spent. Yeah, it was. For sure. That's pretty cool. I'm into that. That guy was, I, I met him at Cars and Coffee one day. And he was great. Yeah, I like that very guy. nice guy. What's his name? Oh, uh, Lewin. sorry. Lewin. Huh? Lewin. Lewin. Um, that's pretty fucking cool. I'm into it. We don't have to give away the. Uh, we're doing. You know, we did Cayman vs. Corvette, best uh, best car under a hundred, best sports car for a hundred k or less. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to <clears throat> give away the much about that. But we rented the Corvette, and I've been waiting. I, I remember saying when I drove the C8 Corvette uh, press car. That it was great and I loved it and it's value, performance, whatever, democratizing what Ferrari had done with the 458. That's what Corvettes do. And I remember saying, I can't wait to drive a rental with a bunch of miles on it and, and see how it held up. Hmm. And so we rented this one from a place on Turo, that, but it wasn't just like some enthusiast. It was, it was a business Correct. that had like 20 or 30, you know, semi-exotic rental cars uh, 911s and G-Wagons and shit like that. And so it had 22,000 miles on it. Mm -hmm. And I drove it for a little bit, and you drove it a bunch, and I thought it was a little scruffy. Really? Yeah. Um, it did. It had some issues. And, but, I, and I'm going to, like, I will ignore the steering wheel because, so the steering wheel was, like, like the know, steering wheel cover was like it. coming apart, kind of coming apart, I would describe like it as coming flaking apart. Su subtly. I I I would chalk that up to either the amount of hand sanitizer right. that customers were using, or whatever they're spraying on the car to quote disinfect it in between rentals yeah. is breaking down the material. I think so, and that's distinctly more than you would happen if it was your own car for yeah. sure. Because the rest of the interior. Decent, I think looked fairly new. Honestly, it was pretty decent. Yeah, and, um, and um, but it had like kind of an exhaust tick sound. It it didn't sound quite as smooth as the press car yeah. for sure. It shifted a little rough. Oh, really? It, I thought it kicked a little bit more than the press car did in the in, same in mode. In the chill mode, in tour oh, okay. mode. Yeah, um, and I thought the blinkers felt really cheap. When yeah, I but they felt the cheap when I used the new one. They might have, yeah. yeah. Um, the seats held up pretty good. I thought yeah. the seats were were good. I was very, I, and the ride to me was still great. Sure, the ride, but, yeah, and, and, yeah, yeah. The suspension and stuff was fine, and it, other than the fact that the V had fallen off the badge, <laughs> the exterior was in pretty looked pretty good. Yeah, it looked like it held up pretty well. Uh, good, good on the rental company. It had good tires on it. Yep. It didn't have shit tires, so it that's still had a, PS4s. Yeah, that was that was appreciated. Yeah, um, you know, it was worth whatever it ended up being three hundred bucks. It was it was really like two hundred bucks, but then we had to move the rental, which was a hundred. So yeah. it ended up being three hundred. But really, for two hundred a day, if you're coming to LA and you want to hit the canyons or something, two hundred a day, you'd have a great time. Absolutely, yeah. and. It was so comfortable on the highway. Like I, I literally had the thought when I drove home that they had somehow smoothed out I-10 yeah, in between when not. I went to work. Yeah, of course they didn't. <laughs> but it felt like a completely different road from when I drive it in my car or the RSQ sure. the day before it even. Like it just rides so good. Mm -hmm. Just that mid-engine setup with the mag ride. Holy shit. Mm. It's an impressive car. Yeah. But that the steering wheel was pretty nasty. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I, I don't know if it was was this was that car a one LT? Yeah, 
Right. So I the press cars I've driven have all been three LTs. The fancy one. They're fancy. Everything yeah. in the interior is the, the best materials. This one, the interior did feel cheaper. There's hard plastic. Yeah. The center console and all that stuff was hard plastic, and it, it felt substantially cheaper than the three LTs that, that we drove, which makes sense because it is. Yeah, like $30,000 cheaper. It's a, it's a lot cheaper. Yeah, twenty five. Um, I don't know the exact number. If you say so, sure. But um, it was pr- it was pretty good for twenty thousand rental miles. I thought it held up pretty pretty well. And I'll and I'll forgive the steering wheel thing because I don't think that would happen to your own car. Yeah. And I think if you, I mean, people probably romp on this thing. Oh, I'm sure. I think we I think we treated it better than most people would treat it. Honestly. Well, we let the car warm up first before we jump on the gas. You know, I think a lot of people just get in and go, go, go and drive yeah. it hard. And, uh, you know, I was I was honestly impressed with how it's held together. We've driven rental cars like Pacificas yeah. that had fewer miles and felt far worse. That Ford Escape I drove in Miami, uh, I've had two Ford Escapes. I it did one I got in uh, South Carolina when I went to go drive the, uh, the 86 Cup car last summer, mm-hmm. and then another Ford Escape in Miami in January, and both of them, the gearboxes were fucked, and they both had under 15,000 miles on it. And how hard could anybody possibly be driving a fucking Ford Escape? You know what and I mean? And the roads like, are fairly smooth in uh, Florida, right? Or is it the highways? Yeah, I was but, in Miami. I mean, right. what, are you, who's, what are you doing with, in Miami with a with a Ford Escape that's fucking the gearbox up? But it, yeah. was, it was shit. Oh, I think that's like... It's the bad gearbox. It's the bad gearbox, It is. Yeah. I can't believe they're still making this fucking thing. It's crazy. They got like, there's, they got sued. Like, there's yeah. like so many they recalls. Did. They're still making this fucking thing. For anyone who says, like, oh, you're being paid by Ford, Ford's fucking escape gearbox is a piece of junk. Yeah. I, I, think... I also call the Mustang gearbox a piece of junk, by the way. Also true. I, 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 I think I'm pretty fucking fair to Ford. I call things they make actual junk. They had, a, okay, so they had a recall due to a transmission defect, uh, recalled 3 million vehicles in 2013 <laughs> through 2021 model yeah. years. Uh, yeah. That's all of them. <laughs> it's like every it, small it car they make. It included 1.7 million Ford Escapes, 500,000 yeah. Edges, and 440,000 Fusions. Yep. Yeah. Not good. So, That's a lot. So there's that. Three million. Hmm. Oh, that was for a roll a roll away risk. Yeah. It's just a bad transmission. Oh, inability to shift. In, I mean, I guess this was recalled for an inability to shift into gear, but it also seems to have a little bit of trouble shifting between gears. It definitely has trouble shifting between gears. I wow. feel like a little buzz. Hmm. I bet. Louie Louie. Five MGs. Five MGs and five MG CBDs. <laughs> Not bad. The MG GT. So it's like actually a very pleasant uh, vibe that really does feel like uh, much more like smoking a bowl than it does uh, eating. eating it. Well, yeah. we are 37 minutes in. I, I think I think my friend Eric is telling the truth about this product. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that the science was right. Good on you. We have to get some of this shit for the shop. He only gave me two cans. Oh, but he sent a case of it here. It's supposed to arrive tomorrow. He's, He's coming drank back. The whole thing. I got to tell Vinny to fucking open that box and stash it. For yeah. <laughs> so the whole crew doesn't accidentally drink it and think right? it's just soda. Yeah. It has cool. a really good. He wrote a really good line on the back too. The drink you never knew that you always wanted, which I think is a very nice, uh, nicely crafted sentence. Okay, <clears throat> Zach said that if we came up with some topics for this show, more than just here's what we drove this week and talking about John dying again, uh, <laughs> that we could that we could have some possibly uh, good Instagram friendly bits to to give to the social media folks. That's true. That is the business plan. So he threw he threw a couple at me. He said, "How about three best race tracks, three worst cars that." you've driven and three <clears throat> worst automotive journalism moments mm-hmm. and i added a dot 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 and what i learned from them mm, because okay. yeah. my my three worst journalism moments were all valuable lessons i mean most bad moments <clears throat> are yeah uh my my three tracks are not that interesting they're pretty predictable in fact i said spa road america and laguna seca okay and they they have uh, many things in common. Uh, you could go over 150 miles an hour on all of them. 
In fact, at Spa and Laguna Seca, you can do it in a couple places. Uh, they all have a bunch of elevation. Mm-hmm. Elevation is key. They're they're all pretty long. Laguna's not, but Laguna's elevation pays off for it being very long. They're all very fast. Spa and they they have very few slow corners. Um, Spa only has one slow corner. Two. They have one chicane and then the hairpin yeah. before the front straight. Those are the only slow corners. Uh, Laguna has, only has turn eleven. That's the only. Are the corkscrew? But yeah. the corkscrews. The corkscrew is a slow corner, but. It's not really a slow corner. Well, it's but it's exciting. It's slow, but it's exciting. Right. Uh, Let's say they all have only one, one or two boring yeah. corners. Because turn two at Laguna is still kind of quick. Eh, it's not quick, but it's like still. It's not like a hairpin. Right. Yeah. It's not. It's, it's not it's first a, gear. It's a. It's yeah. a. It's a top a second, bottom a third That's for true. most cars. That's true. Yeah. Uh, and. They're they're fast. They're long. They're elevate. Big elevation changes. Big speed and very good tarmac. Is pretty much what what my do you so do you like going as fast as possible? Like higher speeds are more enjoyable to you on tracks nowadays. Like and has yeah. that changed as you've driven and raced more? Like did you ever like slower, tighter stuff for a while or no? I like a medium. I don't like slower. Like a lot of the club tracks I drive, like Thermal Club and and this one, the Concourse Club in Miami. No disrespect to them. They they have they they're doing a thing and and what they're doing doesn't really enable you to have a track the size of Road America. They're trying to be as close to the middle of a city as yeah. possible, which has its own limiting factors. Uh, and they're also catered to uh, more entry level drivers for the most part. These these tracks are all kind of old school. They're all built in the the sixties or or before. Um, Although spa, there was old spa and new spa, and they're not the same thing. I forget exactly when new spa was built. Mm-hmm. It might have been in the maybe the eighties. Road America takes up six hundred and forty acres. Yeah, like yeah. like I think thermals like one hundred and fifty acres for comparison. And you could probably put Watkins Glen. You yes, could, if you love Road America, Watkins you'd Glen. also love Watkins Glen. Yeah, they're very similar. Um. But those are my three, and and they're they're pretty obvious choices, I think. I, I think Road America edges out Watkins Glen by a little bit because you can hit 153 times a lap in Road America. Watkins is real fun. It but is. I think I also chose Road America, not Watkins, and then I chose Palmer, which is oh, kind of a Palmer. An oddball. Palmer, Palmer is awesome. Yeah, because yeah. it just that's a you're fucking roller coaster. Quarry. That track. The elevation is weird, and like the switchbacks mm. are slow, but I think they're exciting. Pull and up a, a, an aerial a... view of Palmer. Can we get like the air? Because this this is from a. It's probably the best place in America to use a drone, because the elevation. Where's the good aerial section? This one's okay. Yeah, I mean that that photo kind of kind of does it. The the one on the top left also kind of does it. Nah, it really yeah, doesn't. It looks too flat. It looks it is too not. flat. I mean, the elevation changes enormous. Down here. oh there d- there that track this yeah that 3D one render yeah that the 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 one in to the left there that one yeah that one sh- kind of shows it. It's probably a a hundred foot. Oh more for sure from from the bo- so the front straight let's call it the bottom that's the lowest point on the track. And then you have you know big turns, big turns like, and then when you crest to the top, I think it's like 150, 200 feet. It's because built I remember on the side there. of a ma- on the side of a mountain, and yeah. those uphill S's, which are in the front of this picture, are awesome for drifting. Yes, awesome. You can really get and, your weight transfer going there in a in a great way. Except for go back to the well, photo. This turn, uh, oh, they call it. Uh, oh, this is running reverse. No. Maybe we ran it reverse when we filmed it. We ran it when we filmed it. We definitely ran this way. Oh yeah, no, I hill, went the other way. And then um, uh, Dyers are hard. Just drifted. This whole thing was awesome. And then there's like this crest turn here. Like mm-hmm. it just has so many fun little things, especially for a track that's like laid in back and forth on itself. Yeah. There's an off camber turn as you come over the main, uh, the, like the peak of the track, that is very exciting, especially if you're in a rear engine car and tires are a little cold. Um, I just thought it was a really unique thing, just built into the side of a mountain like this. Yeah, it's uh, that's a great one. Good, good selection. Um, Road America also on my list, and uh, Sonoma. 
I just love Sonoma. Hmm. I just think I like the carousel. I mm -hmm. think that's a very exciting high G kind of corner. And then the S's is such an exciting thing to me because you just feel the car moving, even though it's over quickly. And you can still go plenty fast on straightaway into turn one. Like it just has a lot of these crests yeah. followed by camber changes or just strange weight transfers for the car. And I just like that stuff. If they, <clears throat> Sonoma could make my list if it had better tarmac. Mm. When I was just, I was there, you know, uh, three weeks ago, yeah. and I and I ran fifty laps in the ben, in the Bentley V eight S, um, and it's just it's fucking bumpy. They really yeah. gotta really really repave it. Um, there's there's some sections that I really didn't enjoy anymore because they were so bumpy. Well, it just it needs. It, it needs new tarmac. The layout is amazing. The, you're right. The downhill S's and the turn, you know, one, two, three, four is mm -hmm. awesome there. Yeah, I exciting. Mean, very challenging um, and exciting. Zero G, um, uphill, you know, that first turn one uh, in a fast car, you can take that over 100 miles an hour, which mm -hmm. is awesome. Really load up as you go up the hill. And you don't have to, it's because it's, that uphill turn, in it, you don't have to really beat up the brakes either. The, it makes the brakes last yeah. longer. And then the right hand off after it is like slightly off camber. You can get a slide like, going oh, there for yeah. sure. Front wheel drive, whatever. Like yeah. You can get it wrong. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Like that place. Those are good choices. Well, there you go. Leave a comment. What are your three best racetracks? Don't DM me. Leave a comment. That's how this works. <laughs> don't, you don't, don't, don't divert from the formula. I'll call you, but if you come by, I won't call you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Leave a message. Don't show up at my fucking door. Yeah. Um, okay, well, that was fun. The three worst cars. Now, I intentionally am not... I have left off any individual's personal car from this list. There's my three cars are two production cars... And I've divided this into individual categories as well. Mm. So I have three subcategories of worst car. I have the worst concept executed badly. I have the best concept executed badly. And then I have the uh, worst example of burning brand credibility. Okay. okay, so so the worst concept executed badly was called the Crowrx K R O W R X oh, yeah. exoskeleton race car, and this was at the height of the exoskeleton car trend, and some guys thought it would be a good idea to take the floor pan of an Acura K R O W R X, Zach, K no not C R O. K R O W R X. W R X. If I was them, I would have wiped their. Oh, wow, they still exist? Holy shit, their shop opens on fucking Monday? Oh, <laughs> that, that looks like the drives version of my video. Yeah, it is. So they took Can an accurate. It's not the same thing as should. That's the tagline. Yeah. <laughs> they, uh, they, they basically took the floor pan of an Acura Integra and then cut everything else off and then just welded a bunch of tubes. So that is not the same thing as an Aerial Atom, which is designed to be right. this. And even an Aerial Atom, by the way, I, you drove the Nomad, mm -hmm. I drove the original, the Atom. I drove the four, Atom 4 also. I think I would drove the, I think it was the, the two or the three. Yeah, they, they've updated it, but you know. Could you feel the chassis flexing? Because I fucking could. No. Really? But I drove the three Nomad, which, which leaned, yeah, that's, and then I drove yeah. the four, which is the brand new one, and it's so so loud and scary, I wasn't really paying attention. Okay. But, but also, Di drove it, and he didn't say the chassis flex. So. I felt like I could feel the chassis flex. So, But this was just, this was a terrible idea, because an Acura Integra is a unibody vehicle. And if you remove the unibody, the floor plan really has no structure. And what you what they've added there is certainly not as strong as a unibody. Right. And the weight distribution is now completely fucked up. The, you can see the engine. It's a front-wheel drive car, and the engine is out in front of the front wheels for the most part. The head is at least in front of the front wheels or in front of the front axle. Right? And there's a car that is, you know, a, a car... Even an aerial atom 
has an aerodynamic element at the nose. Like mm-hmm. you get shit goes up your pants in an aerial atom, but but there is that front aerodynamic element that bends the For air sure. around it's you. It's shaped like a kayak. You know, it <laughs> yes, really is. Exactly. So it's you're not it's you're not it's not like riding a, a, a dirt bike on the highway where you're like, Ugh, you know, fucking hang on for dear life because you're a sail. Right. This you fucking are. There's there is clearly no air direction where there should be air direction. Where's the radio? Oh, the radiators in the back. Yeah. So the so yeah, the they rear mount the radiator. The leading too. edge is the header and the engine, <laughs> yeah. which is quite flat. Yeah. And, and concave then, in a way. And then yeah. the weight distribution's messed up. So when you hit the brakes, you just lock them and slide. <laughs> you know, when you try to turn the the weight distribution being messed up and you actually can't really get enough heat into the tires to really make them work. So you just kind of slide around. And I don't know what the state of these tires were, but it looks like they're fucking slicks, frankly, it does. which is unnecessary. Well, because they're sliding around. Yeah. They probably started you can't out. Get, you can't get enough heat. In the, you can't go fast enough confidently enough to get heat into a slick tire. You'd be better off with a fucking all season, frankly. And then you get, you're getting so blasted in the face by everything because there is nothing to deflect the air around you at all. Um, yeah, the, the overall experience is incredibly poor. Makes sense. Yeah. I can't believe that place is still open. <laughs> the fact that they have a Google Maps link. That was it, that was one of the worst things, and and I said I wasn't going to crap on people's interviews. This is a company that wanted to sell that. Right. They were like they're marketing that as a as a thing. And I'd add that you know we got a second opinion here from James Gilroy <laughs> from the Drive, who also says like this proves that less isn't always more. Like it's, it's well, not just I don't you. know if that's a. I think if you scroll down, I think this is a. I think they embedded my video and just wrote an intro oh, to it because okay. that's. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, that's true. Uh, it was uh, it was see there so there's the Ariel Adam photo yeah. with the, oh you're right I thought he drove it too with the nose oh, cone um yeah it wasn't oh there's a quote uh, skip ahead to 905 when Matt is forced to let a Nissan Juke tailing him play through a Juke if that doesn't bother you do as you wish but don't expect the result to be anything other than painfully slow and maybe painfully dangerous because an integra with mods on it is not going to get walked by a juke bro at that same track event i was at um james uh oh my god i'm blanking his fucking name um i'm gonna think of it at hunt <laughs> no, be, at, i'm gonna think of it at the same time that right when the show ends i'm going to remember this guy's name the guy who set the track record in an integra he ran he ran as fast as like a nine a 991 cup car in a fucking acura integra it's like k something racing uh mm, shit well time that's that's the car James Houghton. K-tuned. James Houghton. James Houghton's K-tuned Acura Integra Type R. That car is, it's so fast, it blows the gearbox like every five laps. Is it faster than the Crowworks one? Yeah. It is? Yeah. Oh. Like, like he sets track records. Like, it's insane. I know you were trying to joke and I didn't bite. I'm sorry. Um, Okay. So that was my number one. And that's worst concept, worst executed. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you want to ping pong on this? What's your worst? Sure. Well, I didn't do the subcategories. I That's wasn't okay. aware of them, but uh, I did. That's what you get cars. for not telling me the qualifications last time when we talked about road trips. That's true. That wasn't intentional. That was <laughs> your dick. Um, uh, t- 2013 Shelby GT500. Oh, I have that too. I mean, we had it at the same time. Yeah. Press car. There's a house press car. Yeah, I had that for um, best idea executed most poorly. Because I think for me, we had the, the 302 Laguna Seca edition, like, at the same time, right around there. It was just before, yeah. Like, And that showed me how good a Mustang could drive as an all-around performance sports car, mm. not like a muscle car. And the GT500 felt like a huge step back in time. Yeah. Like, way too much engine, too much weight in the front, not enough, t- 265 rear. Yeah, not enough rear tire, horse, not six, nearly enough rear brake. Not enough brake. Or front brake. Like, the, the balance was wrong, the brakes were wrong, the tire was wrong, and it just felt like... 
a step backwards, especially around the same time we had the ZL1, right. which let's say was a similar formula, but executed so well. Right, and they changed the gear ratios because Carroll Shelby was gonna die, and he wanted to see a Mustang that could do zero to 60 in under four seconds and hit 200 miles an hour. So in order to hit those metrics, they lengthened first gear. They basically used like Viper gear ratios. So they lengthened first gear super long, and then they lengthened sixth gear super long, right? And then they uh, couldn't really do either. Yeah. We, we have magazine friends that said they couldn't replicate the 200 mark. Yeah. Like it, it, you need a tailwind, cold temperatures. I think it's And really you needed hard. drag radials to actually hit 60 in under four seconds also because oh. it would blow the fucking 265 tires off. Such a small tire. So it, it couldn't really do either of those things. And to do those metrics... Compared to the 2011 GT500, which was amazing, they actually made the car worse to drive to satisfy what Carol wanted mm. in, to get that magazine cover. So, yeah, best. And then I, 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 I had a tie for that for that one, uh, which with the Alfa Romeo 4C. Oh, which was a great idea, yeah. but executed very poorly, 100%. and and led result is a car that is actually quite terrible to drive. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> God, it's such a bummer. And then I, uh, I had um, the worst burned brand credibility was the Cadillac CT5 V non Blackwing all wheel drive, mm. which drove just bad. It just was bad. It just from to go from the 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 CTS V before that with the Z06 motor and the sweet diff and the, all the fancy shit where I was able to do full drift laps. I, yeah. not fucking Dai Yoshihara, Matt Fat fucking Farah was able to do full drift laps of Willow Springs. To go from that to the car I drove, the CT5 V, non-Blackwing, toasted that V brand. It, it, is, it was gone. Is that a situation where the V for a while was just the highest performance, and then they tried to do like an S-line situation? Yeah. They did V Sport. They, right. Remember V Sport? Right. Yeah. We and, did the Goodfellas thing. They get used to it, yeah. With V Sport. Yeah. Um, but that but V Sport didn't stick. They wanted to, to now, so they made, they made Blackwing and fucking fine, whatever. You want Blackwing? Okay. But for that in-between time... V didn't mean fuck all. Yeah, you got to get no a new good. letter. Yeah. It was no good. Yeah, they should have done S or something. <laughs> T, yeah, just do S. Fucking Z, I don't know, anything. But not, but like, it took, when did the first CTSV come out? 2004 ish. Three, four, right? So they spent 18 years on V. And then, like, and then they were like, I know, yeah, we'll put that letter on a car that doesn't have a Corvette engine in it. It's all-wheel drive and automatic and yeah. stinks. Yeah. <laughs> it's got to be so it. hard to, as a brand manager to plan like the different versions of a car. Yeah. And then four years in, you're like, we got to change a letter. And you're like, <laughs> fuck! You're like, you spent years thinking this out. Sure. You know, it's like chess. And then all of a sudden, they're like, actually, V-Sport or whatever. Mm -hmm. All right, so what is, your, what is your next one? Uh, Dodge Nitro. It was oh, a personally owned well, vehicle that's by a, a friend of ours. Yeah, that's but, just that's terrible. But I was so surprised at how slow I was mm -hmm. and how bad the gas mileage was. Mm -hmm. Like it has stuck in mm -hmm. my brain. Seventeen miles per gallon highway for a car that made got. like hundred and eighty horsepower couldn't pass anyone. <laughs> and I was watching. Thad and I were so poor at the time. We were watching the fuel <laughs> gauge go down, and we're just watching like our money go away. And we're like, ha but we've only gone forty miles. Yeah. Like. <laughs> At 80 miles, 75 miles Oh, did you take it hour. skiing or something No, once? no, we Is borrowed that... it for a, a production, like with uh, Musto. Oh. Because we needed a car, and yeah. I mean, he eyed me out at the time and whatever. But just watching the fuel gauge go down as if we were driving a GT500. <laughs> but I just couldn't believe that it. That was, was... a bad vehicle. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was... These other cars I, 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 I put on worst because... You know, my expectations were set somewhere, and the gap between expectation and reality. Mm. You know, a new GT500 comes out, like, pff, what are the odds that's not good? Right. It's not like the GT500 has ever been bad, ever. And so, the, but this car, even if you got one as a rental and it was 40 bucks a day, it would be a terrible, terrible car. Yeah. And it had, like, the most truck steering yeah. of— It, it was drove like a, like a Wrangler. <laughs> but it didn't have any of the utility of a yeah. Wrangler. It was yeah. a weird thing. Well, there was a, a Jeep. 
isn't there a Jeep version of it? Isn't the Jeep Compass? Yeah, same thing. Compass, it is Patriot, right. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. But did the but the Dodge didn't have any of the Jeep like four by four shit. I don't know. We didn't this take one it was this one was just a fucking did. front wheel drive, but it still was like Wrangler steering. Yeah, yeah, it was terrible. What a terrible car. <laughs> Do you have a third as well? Yeah, uh, Lamborghini Aventador, first gen. Yeah, right. Yeah. Have you the, driven any of the, any of the newer ones? What's the newest Aventador you drove? I probably drove one two years ago or something like that. A current one? Oh, no, a, you a, and I took and filmed. Oh, uh, the Ultimate. The Ultimate. Yeah. That was definitely the best one. Yeah, that was. But yeah. things I've driven before that, I mean, I mean, I, don't, I haven't driven the th- ones in the middle, but when we went and filmed Kuntat versus Aventador. Yeah, that was first gen. The, what it did for me is I had this expectation because supercar, hypercar, like mm-hmm. this This advertises its horsepower. It's four hundred eighty thousand dollars in twenty twelve. You know, it's it's got whatever. Like, and then I drove it and I went, "Why does this understeer like a front wheel drive car? Mid corner, apply throttle like you would in any other mid mid engine car. It would just lift. Yeah. And then the front would get light at not at high speeds. Yeah. And I read this in other places. It wasn't me. Like, this was a really weird experience. Can't see out of it. Feels gigantic and yet claustrophobic. Yeah. It is. And, and I think I realized that what I want from a supercar is what the Huracan or the smaller Ferraris deliver versus these giant things that you have to drive on the right street and to the right building with the mm-hmm. right driveway. Otherwise, it, you freak out, you hit something, and, yeah. and, and then it executed the dynamics poorly. That car that was wasn't a disappointment. good. It wasn't good. Yeah. The later cars, specifically the S... SV, SVJ, and Ultima, which are the ones with rear steer. Mm-hmm. That's when yep. it really became. They got. They started putting better tires on the cars. They they widen the wheels, especially the fronts, and rear steer. Those like it, the car got way different and way more agile and way more fun, and it would actually rotate properly. Uh, but the early cars, yeah, they're not. Yeah, they're not good. That would that. That's a good example of expectations versus reality. Yeah, they're, they're, they they. <laughs> I remember telling someone at Lamborghini that I had to drive it like a front wheel drive car, and they were like, "What do you mean?" And I was like, "You know, like late brake, trail brake, and then like not touch the gas until the wheels are pointed straight again." Yeah. Like weird. It's very weird. Really strange car. Yeah. Well, that's. I think that's a good spread. Exam representative. Should we talk about worst journalist moments, or should we tease that for the pro driver show or something? Uh, we're here now. We're at an hour. I mean, we're, we're here. We'll, we we'll just it. knock it out. Yeah, it's we can do it. A, it won't be a long moment. All right, you start. Uh, the first press rolling, car I ever got. Rolling the, is rolling the Can-Am on there? Oh, of course. Okay. I mean, that's, yeah. <laughs> and people have heard that story, but some of yeah. you haven't. Okay, I know you've heard it like 12 times, so I apologize. But That's no, okay. Um, but the first one I listed is actually the first press car I got, which was from you, which was a Jaguar XF. Oh, I'm still living up one. here. And you were like, hey, man, we got this car. You know, I, I was writing for TST, the, right. the website, and you had to do something else. And, and I was so excited. But I fell into all the cliches of Jaguar reviewership, which is like prowling through traffic, muscular haunches, like all these oh, so this writing is what cliches. You just, you're just, it's the writing cliches. The writing cliche. Okay. I didn't do anything yeah. wrong with the car. I yeah. didn't break anything. I didn't crash I thought anything. you were about to tell me you like fucked it up and shadily had it fixed without telling no, me. No, no, no. That would have been amazing. Dude, <laughs> no way. I did not do anything like that. Uh, I just... I wrote a piece. That's a real challenge, that was though, because even then, that would have been a hard car to write about because it was already like old and like. To not me, it was so that new and exciting, and I liked the way it looked, and I thought it sounded good and all that stuff. Mm. And I liked some of the, you know, interesting tech inside, even though I knew it was going to break immediately. Remember the vents that would hide? Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, even then, I watched that and went, "There's no way this lasts for five years." My mom's F-type but, has those vents too, and Hannah fucking hates them. They're cool. They they look cool, but she hates them. Why? I think she doesn't like the the. I think they blow air really high. I think you can't like point them to the, the down in the right way. There's been a couple cars I've driven where I've been appalled at what you can can't and can't aim. do with vents. What's the car? Is it Tesla? Where like there's some vents that you can't aim them. It's just fixed. And I drove a, a car recently that had that. It was only one of the vents, like in the center. But it was a fixed wing. Yeah. And then the rest of it you can aim. But I was like, but this one's cold. Oh, I'm um, blanking on it now. But I remember driving a car. It might have been, a, I want to say it's a, a Mercedes because I thought I remember the vent being round. No, it's Aston Martin. It's either the vent, it's either the, 
It's got to be the Vantage. I'm pretty sure the current Vantage has a vent that you can only aim at your face. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's the See, Vantage. If we can find it. Yeah, it is. It's the center vents in the Vantage. The center vents in the Vantage cannot point oh, down enough. And I'm tall. Like, they're, they're, the dashboard has them facing up, and the, the, the controllers do not allow you to point them down at your it face. It feels like they were installed upside down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can Talk pop them out and switch, flip them around. That would be awesome. That would be a funny mod. Yeah. <laughs> Euro mirrors. God. Yeah. yeah. Euro, Euro, vet, Euro, vet, yeah Euro, Euro vents. I, I stepped on the joke because I had five MGs. Sorry. Um Okay, so you, so you're it was yeah it was poor writing embarrassment. cliche yeah. writing embarrassment. Yeah. Okay, um, well two of my three are crashes. Oh, so okay, so the the number one is is crashing the Honda in New Zealand, which was a guy's personally owned Time Attack car. Was it? It was a Civic. Okay, yeah, the Time oh, Attack yeah, Civic, yeah, yeah. and uh, I, I that the lesson of that was if the conditions are not appropriate just fucking say no yeah it was raining right it was pissing rain the track was soaking wet mm -hmm. the car it didn't have slicks but it was like basically slicks like whatever whatever the most aggressive time attack tire was at the time yeah. it was cold the guy probably made the tires with a bread knife he, you know he like probably he, shaved he ordered the slicks fucking... and then he just cuts it with a bread knife and then you know you got there you know he Probably I'm fucking for real. did. He yeah. probably did. But they were not rain appropriate yeah. tires. And I felt pressure to, to drive because these the these guys, the automation guys had rented the track and the the people who owned the cars had shown up and it was like a far drive for everybody. And I was like, no, no, we, we have to do it because otherwise people's time and money is wasted. But but I should have just said no. I should have just said this is not appropriate for me to get in a random person's car on a track in these conditions and really be expected to do, you know. I, I, I don't think I made it two laps. Did you go off? Did you understeer into something I, and I, like hurt the front? I, I hit the brakes. The sec I was one very slow warm-up lap, started to pick up the pace a little bit, and then I just hit the brakes to slow down you know, and the fucking tires just insta locked. And I was in the grass before I could even understand what the fuck just happened. And, uh, you know, I, I like, you know, I was, a, I was a passenger and I hit a tire wall and I, it wasn't bad. It was a headlight and a front bumper mm -hmm. and maybe a hood. You know, the car was drivable. Yeah. It's not like, it's not like I, I totaled the guy's car, but I, I don't remember if I didn't have a checkbook on me. But whatever it was, I found. I guess it was. It would have been PayPal, maybe then. I think PayPal probably would have worked in 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, but I PayPaled the guy 2,500 US dollars then and there, and I should have just fucking. And he he was ha he was actually very cool. Yeah. I mean, he obviously wasn't pleased about his car, but at least I was like taking responsibility for it and paid him right there for, you know, whatever it would cost him to fix it and. He was as cool as someone could be in that situation. Uh, but, yeah, uh, crashing we, someone's personally owned car on a racetrack. Was that is, the track where we filmed three cars in a day? Yep. It was like the Mitsubishi, the A86, yep. and that car? Yep. And I had after that crash, I had to get into the Mitsubishi in yeah. the same conditions Which is also, and film that. No, that was Evo swap, so it was all-wheel drive. It was, a, was, it was a basically mirage, a, right? a Mirage and an Evo mashed together into one car, yeah. and he built basically a two-door Evo that was incredible. It was. <laughs> a really fucking cool car. <laughs> yeah. And the, the, the driver's seat was where the back seat was. So you had to climb in and climb like back yeah. and have that the steering, steering column extension. that was super yeah. long. I mean it was it was crazy. But if I was that guy, I would have been shitting myself. This guy just crashes a car and now he's gonna get in mine, you yeah. know, and I wouldn't have blamed him because I was shitting myself. Like I can't believe I have to do this now. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, that's that's number one. That's a hard day. <laughs> it is. It <laughs> yeah, just it was is a terrible. You feel like you got punched day. in the stomach, man. Yeah. You hurt someone else's uh, equipment like that. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, my two. But let me just say that both okay. of my crashes were on racetracks. I have a, I have a flawless safety record when it comes to driving people's cars in the street. Me too. Yes. <laughs> Technically, my accident was in a parking lot. <laughs> I. Oh yeah, yeah right. <laughs> it's not. A, it wasn't a street. Yeah. Um, my second one is very is quick and more funny, and uh, it was a Jeep event in. I think 2015. I wasn't. 
I wasn't dating Sarah yet. We were good friends, but she was having an, the worst time at jo- her job where people were throwing phones at the wall and like a bad time with her now ex-boyfriend. Cell phone durability like, tester. That yeah, was her just, last she job. worked for one of those people. It yeah. was just a total asshole. And I got invited to this Jeep event in Malibu where it's like drive some concepts and some new press stuff. And they had like the Hemi Jeep there and she loved Jeeps. And I was like, do you want to come with me? And she's like, sure. And she like played hooky from work. And I, I was like, okay, but I had told the press people. I didn't know at the time that you could just like probably bring someone for, this wasn't like we're flying to Italy yeah, or yeah. we're going to Antarctica. It was like, do you have an extra sandwich for someone who might enjoy it? They wouldn't give a shit. So I lied and said that they were that Sarah was the accountant for the company I worked for to the <laughs> PR people. And I told her this. I was like, all you have to do is say that like this is what you do and you're scouting an event because you've never been to one before. And she went, okay. And we walk up to Scott Brown. And I say, hey, Scott, nice to see you. As I told you, this is Sarah. She's like, uh, you know, the account executive, new person at this company. Yeah. And he looked at her and she looked at him and she went, uh, and then he looked back at me and went, great to have you here. <laughs> he, like he hundred percent knew that both of us were full of shit. And That's then we had a great funny. day, but he like, you That's know, at the time I was hilarious. so new, I didn't know what you could, you could do or not. Yeah, you probably could have been like, this is my girlfriend. And I could have said that. Yeah. I could have said, she loves Jeeps. We both yeah. live here. This is it was a very low cost event. Yeah, yeah. But I just watched her fail at the lie immediately. Yeah, it was so good. That's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, uh, I like that. My second one is another crash: the Audi R8 at, in Eng- in Wales. Um, that one, I learned uh, it was also raining. Uh, the track was very wet. It was my literal first lap of the track. Like literally my warm up lap, I'd never been on this track before. I think we were in a scouting train, right? We were in a scouting like, train. Yeah. And I uh was just I don't know how this happened really, but I tried to exit a corner kind of aggressively and I put the my outside wheels on the curbing of the track, which it was raining, happened to be very, very wet, and I and the back of the car instantly touched wet grass, which then sucked the front into wet grass, and I was instantly a passenger. And in about three seconds went from just scouting a track to being in a tire wall. And it was fucking dumb. Uh, and uh, I learned um, that one to Always, always, always um, work your way up. Don't, mm. don't like think you're just going to show up at a track and like know things like this curbing is incredibly slippery when it's <laughs> yeah. wet. Yeah. You know, like, t- you know, there's no, uh, especially in that case, because we did have like plenty of time to do the things we were supposed to be doing and I wasn't rushed. I would have had plenty of time to figure out the nuances of the track and and do that and uh yeah that one was ugly that one was it was expensive car too Mm -hmm. fortunately audi was understanding about it um but yeah not great (laughs) we had to rewrite the episode real Mm -hmm. quick (laughs) yeah and i and i inconvenienced a bunch of other people uh by doing that as well and so um you know, and the other lesson of that is if you're going to do something with the car that's fucking risky in any way, do it at the end and then also tell all the camera people you're doing it. Right. Because it could have been part of the story if there were any cameras on the car. And then it maybe would have at least contributed to the content, but it wasn't. Yeah. So it was fucking stupid. Yep. Uh, uh, okay. Number three. Remember, number three. <laughs> One, absolutely my worst day professional and, and I'd say one of my worst days in life and I include trips where I've gone to the hospital um, was I mean, I'll try to tell the concise version I flipped a razor in front of you Mike Musto JF Musial Thad Brown and Chris Harris mm-hmm. and then and, and, and some other camera guys you know some people I'd met before and worked with a long time Chris I don't think I'd ever met before and I was very excited to work with and uh I had been in charge of fielding, receiving 16, 16 press cars at one location in one day. 
So everyone's coming in to shoot this mega thing, and I'm in charge of getting every key, every car dropped off, and I'm doing this at a production facility, <clears throat> standing in the sun, and it was like a camera car production facility. And the guy was very nice who ran the camera car department. He just was letting me use the parking lot, and he just saw I was bored after like five hours, and he's like, do you want to go drive this side-by-side -side around? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, just go, have fun with it. And I was like, okay. So I did that for like half an hour, had fun, parked it, and then uh, and then Thad and some other people arrived. Oh, Thad and one of our camera guys arrived. He's from Scotland, and he had never, we'd never met before. And they show up, and I said, do you want to go for a ride in this thing? you want to drive it? And Thad's like, yeah, you can drive it. I don't want to drive it, but you drive it. So I'm sliding around. I'm like drifting this thing with Thad and the other person are, in the, are on the right side of the car. So all the weight is on the right side of the car, as I would learn. And minivan pulls in with Chris, Musto, JF in the vehicle and Will Barber and I drift around the minivan like a fucking champion I will say that <laughs> and I'm like there we go that's the highlight let's drop the mic and I drove down the street to turn around and I tried to slide to a stop turning left and all the weight on the right side of the vehicle <laughs> went right but the tires didn't and I tipped the fuck over Yeah. and it was and going back to like the, the gut punch I felt like I was going to throw up yeah. I've never apologized so profusely to Simon, the guy who ran the camera car thing. And he's yeah. like, spray paint will fix this. Like, yeah. you have a big project. In the end, like you, this is the beginning of a three-day shoot. Yeah. Not the end. Yeah. And that was one of the worst feelings. Yeah. That's, that Ugh. was... A, Chris Harris wouldn't let you live it down for years. Nope, he won't. Still no. doesn't. Every time I see him, he's like, driven a razor lately. I'm like, fuck <laughs> off, dude. Someone in the comments literally wrote, Chris tells this story better than you. I'm like, yeah, I know, because he knows how to stab me in the kidneys <laughs> yeah, about it. Of course he does. Yeah. He has all those cruel Brit the words oh, that only British people exactly, know. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. God damn it. Such uh, a bad day. Uh, my worst one, and the, I'll tell the lesson first. Um but the lesson is that people will lie to your face, even if they're a somebody who's kind of public, and you shouldn't believe them. So 2010, a friend of ours uh, introduces me to someone named George Gray. And I'll, I'll use his fucking name. I don't give a fuck. And George Gray is the come on down guy on The Price is Right who repl replaced uh, Rod, Rod, whatever his name is. Okay. The original guy retired or died. And this guy's the, now that guy, the come on down guy. Um, if you've never seen The Price is Right, they pull contestants out of the audience and someone goes, <laughs> Dave, <laughs> come on down. That guy. So that's him. So I fucking love The Price is Right. And I thought, uh, AY. And... Uh, <clears throat> And so anyway, this guy is driving, there he is. This guy's driving a replica Ferrari GTO. Okay. I know it's a replica. He tells me it's a replica. But what he tells me is it's built from a Ferrari 250 GTE, which a lot of people were doing. They were converting GTEs into GTOs. And he, he, he called it a bucket of parts was the term he used, it's a bucket of parts. And he goes, but it's got a real Ferrari engine and some of the, the chassis bits from a Ferrari. The body was obviously a replica. Um, and the interior like was not quite right, but like, you know, as it turns out, it was like a, a Datsun Z upper with some like other shit mm -hmm. below it. Um, and so anyway, I make this video with this thing and I think it's kind of cool and I say, what he says, uh, which is that it's got a Ferrari engine in it and and it's 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 got bits from a 250 GTE in it. And he was fucking lying. Mm -hmm. Straight up. Well on it, camera, I interviewed yeah. him. It wasn't just like I lie, like he lied to me and then he lied to you. You the Because you couldn't open the hood latch, right? The hood latch was broken and he wouldn't either try to fix it. We wanted to film the engine right, and he wouldn't show us the engine. Right. Which was a fucking, in hindsight, was a massive red yeah, flag. I just want to add that detail for people because <laughs> they're like, didn't you see the, here, here's why, because you yeah. couldn't look at the engine. And he swore he would get it fixed and let us come back and film it. He never did, obviously. When people, when we ran the video just kind of as is, uh, I said what he said. I went to, I was like, this guy's like, I had just gotten to LA. Oh, there he is. That's the car. Yeah, that's the car. And that's there he is driving it. 
So um, anyway, uh, the guy, he then lied again. You know, we followed up with him like, hey, some people don't think that that what you said is true. He's like, oh, no, it's absolutely true. I'll send you pictures today. And our other friend that we have in common vouched for the guy. They're like, no, no, that guy's that guy's legit. If he, it's totally, totally legit. And so I blindly defended someone I only kind of knew and someone who I didn't know but was a little bit of a somebody in Hollywood. And I don't know if they were both lying or just he was lying. I don't think I don't think the middleman was lying. I think he probably didn't know, you know, yeah, probably given not. the benefit of the doubt, I guess. Yeah. Um but I defended the guy. And I should have thrown him under the bus immediately, immediately. But I had just gotten to L.A. and I was like, this guy works in Hollywood. He's a somebody. Is he really going to lie about this thing to camera? But yes, the answer is yes, he did. Yeah. And there's people who and then I, you know, I defended this guy for a while. Yeah, it's probably all over fucking Internet. If you. Oh, there you go. (laughs) This is why I hate Matt Farah. There you go. Smoking Tire loses credibility over Ferrari, blah, blah, blah. So oh, if you, okay. if there's people who want to fucking shit on me for any number of things, and they always bring that up, mm. always. It's always the first thing they go to. But they usually say that I thought it was a, a totally real car, which is not true. Um, I thought this engine was real because the guy fucking said it was, and it wasn't. And, like, at the time, like... I wouldn't necessarily at the time I wouldn't have been able to tell the difference just by driving it. Right. I probably could now, but I couldn't then. And well, because your experience level then was not a lot not less, it was right? modern yeah. cars. My yeah. experience I, I didn't have yeah. any real experience with old cars. Right. But like yeah, I like yeah. I fucking dove on the grenade. Like I dug my heels in for a couple of days, and then I realized that that was not the right thing to do, and I dove on the grenade. I said, I fucked up. I listened to this guy. But by then, the internet damage had been done. Right. And now, if people want to fucking talk shit on me, they bring up those old Reddit threads or whatever the fuck, and and they say of the, the not the actual story. They don't say he believed this guy and this guy lied to him and whatever. They say that I actually thought it was a real GTO, which I never did. But still, the answer is, you know, when in Hollywood... <laughs> Don't fucking believe what people tell you about their cars um, because they will lie to your face mm-hmm. and they will lie to your camera. And if the hood doesn't open, like <laughs> we don't film the video, because maybe they're lying right? about what's Yeah, under, I mean, you know? you, and you certainly don't defend the guy. Yeah. You know, if you don't, you don't, you don't say that, like, you know, that, that whatever. You don't, just don't, do, this person lied to me and I went to bat for him. Thinking that oh no he he really just it was broken and whatever yeah. why would he you know ah. but no because it's probably a lie that he has per- or, uh, used He's probably a gotten lot away with it for with you know, at, at events or yeah. for you know friends women whatever like car shows well because it's a believable lie like mm-hmm. they they did do that like people did turn 250 GTEs into GTO clones and they would hand make, you know, GTO bodies and 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 mishmash these fucking things together like it's not like that's pulled out of thin air like that's a thing people would do. Oh wait, so what engines in it again? Was it is it Datsun It was a 6 cylinder. Right? Yeah, it was a yeah. Datsun 280ZX engine or something. Yeah. Yeah. Which explains the upper dashboard sort of like Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that sucks. Yeah. Yeah. And I eventually, and it was a Datsun engine. I mean, not I would have known it wasn't a V12 if I fucking looked at it, but it had a Ferrari valve cover on it, which is weird. Um, when I when I eventually someone did eventually send me a picture of it. You're like the um, problem is it only has one. Has one. <laughs> like obviously, right. if if we you know if we had looked at it, we'd been like, well, that's not of correct. Obviously, yeah. but you know, I was driving it very gently. It's not like I you know had a it sounds cammy and and raspy. It had a really loud exhaust on it. I'd never driven a fucking real one, right? You know, to to compare it to. So and the ones we frequently see at car shows tend to be parked and trailed yeah. there. So it's like yeah, like if you go to uh, Concours d'Elegance, the odds of you hearing a running GTO are very slim. pretty low, like real yeah. low. So look, I'm not I'm not trying to say that this didn't fucking happen. It happened. 
Uh, I, I just and it is it was and still is kind of fucking embarrassing. The internet's forever. Yeah. Uh, but there's a lesson in it, and there's also people that like every like once a week or so I get tagged in some bullshit internet post that where someone's trying to say that I thought it was a real car. So I mean that's the that's the thing where people they just want to go after you for something because on the other side the audience that likes you would just recognize oh yeah you made a mistake people make mistakes like you know yeah. the car world is huge and it was 14 years ago and like you can't know everything all the sure. time sure and there's people that won't admit so. their mistakes or won't mm -hmm. apologize for them they'll just hope you fucking forget right. i'm not that kind of person mm -hmm. if i fuck up i'll tell you i fucked up i'll say i'm sorry like i'm not that proud i'd rather just like move on with my life right. frankly and, and, go, and learn, learn something and learn that. some kind of a lesson yeah so there was a lesson in that is it like f <laughs> the fucking come on down guy from the price is right will straight up lie to your face <laughs> real disappointing in a in a long list of celebrity encounters in la only exceeded by my encounter with chris maloney which is the who played oh, elliot yeah. stabler in svu <laughs> saw that motherfucker at tsa and i was addicted to svu i was like dude chris maloney i fucking love svu and he goes good for you <laughs> <laughs> oh man he couldn't even pull out a thanks thanks like a, one like word a, thanks uh, yeah, not, i don't need to be your best friend thanks. dude we're at tsa good just want to say hi and move on good for you <laughs> You got to practice to be that much of a dick to somebody. Maybe he really, he was over that job years before he finally left. Yo, maybe. You know? maybe. You think he thought, it, you think he was locked into that career for too long? I think so. He had that nice little, was it Harold and Kumar stint? He Well, he came up as like a good actor, actor, yeah. Like a comedy guy, and he was in whatever the summer camp sh movie was yeah. that came back. Like, It'd be funny if, he's he's, really if he was funny just dude. that over it, where if you say you like the show he's in, he's like, fuck you. It's like, yeah, <laughs> or he could have been, I, I try to do, I don't meet many celebrities, but I try to give them like two instances of meeting them before I would judge them, only because I've had very bad days, and if the wrong thing was said to me, I might just fire before I even recognize what uh -huh, I'm doing. Uh -huh. And so it's like, look, everyone has a really shitty day. He might have he might have gotten a notification that morning that it's like, you're getting divorced and you also have hep C. Maybe. And he's like, I yeah. want to burn the world down. Yeah, maybe you know? maybe he was raped. Maybe. So that's for you, Joke. I'm just, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Right. Maybe. He's not. <laughs> I, I Nobody wants I to know. talk to anybody in fucking TSA, but like, right. thanks would have done it. I know. Yeah. yeah. I've never, ever in my life been in such a bad mood that if, and I'm not Chris Maloney, I'm not a fucking superstar, but if, but people do stop me and say, hey man, I like your videos or whatever the fuck. I've never, ever, ever been so angry that I couldn't just say, thanks man, yep, and keep true. walking. Yeah. Never. <laughs> yeah, I have been there. I've, yeah, I know. I don't uh, know why he fired off with that. I don't. Yeah. I literally like left my brother-in-law's funeral to go outside and look at someone's E36. Not the ceremony. We were before the ceremony started. <laughs> I didn't get up during, during the in-between speech. Mess. I have an E36. Wait, do, you I did, do you think I chose the right wheels? <laughs> that would be... Wait, Matt, what Psst. should I buy for you had to, If you had to choose between... <laughs> Matt, I'm looking at a 991.1 and a 991.2. No. <laughs> Shout out oh, to are Temple. Are you getting up to talk on the stage? Oh, okay, I'll, I'll ask you afterwards. Dude, in the in the most Gen Z moment ever. <laughs> shout out to him. The kid's name was Temple. It's, it's an interesting name. Yeah, it's interesting true. name. Yeah. Shout out to him. Um, okay. Well, those are. Do you have another one? No, you nope, have three. That yeah. Was it. All right. Well, now you there you have it. The truth of the Ferrari 250 GTO. Fucking come that's on, a bad day. come on Man. down. Yeah, that's <laughs> you're, you're going to be the main character on Reddit today. <laughs> that when the whole internet is talking about you, it's a scary thing, you know. <laughs> oh, that's very funny. Oh, Richard H. If I was forced to live on a Mars colony run by Gun Elon Musk, head. <laughs> if I lived on a Mars colony ran by Elon Musk, that what you've just described is Total Recall. That is the film Total Recall. And what I would do, I hope, is I would hang out with the freaks at the brothel and fucking fight the power. Make me wish hope. I had three hands. I hope. Or I'd be like Mick Fleetwood in that movie. I don't remember who that is. You know, I mean, you know who Mick Fleetwood is. No, I from don't. From Fleetwood Mac. No, nope. That's oh, Mick Fleetwood. I, mean, I couldn't pick him out of he's a lineup. Like the, he's very tall, right? Yeah, he's like 6'6". Six, six, okay, I got Big that. beard, long hair. But in, 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 uh, right. he, he's in Total Recall. Oh. He's one of the resistance guys. He's the guy that moves, that removes Schwarzenegger's uh, uh, prison collar. You know, they've got those exploding collars. 
He plays the guy who removes the, oh, I'm sorry, I fucked that up. That's not Total Recall. It's The Running Man. Oh, which, I just started same kind of post apocalyptic vibe. Very similar. That's Arnold yeah, yeah. Right, right, it's right. also yeah. Schwartz. Yeah. Well, that's why. Very true. It's that those three movies are like it, they're like within a year. That's of why each I other. didn't know who we were talking about in Total Recall. Sorry, because it was a different. Because it was the Running yeah, Man. You know, otherwise I definitely would have remembered. Louis Louis Satsuma helps you five helps MG, you remember obscure five guitarists M, that were in MGs. movies for five <laughs> seconds. Um, uh, and I could only drive a Model Three or Y. Which would I choose? I would drive a Model Y because of the headroom. Ground clearance. Ground clearance and headroom. Yeah, yeah for sure. You gotta wear that helmet. It's Mars. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Brian Lewis, what cars represent the areas they're named after the best or worst? That's a very Ooh. good... That one is great. A great question that maybe we should save for the next show and do it as a bigger topic. Sure. Because there's a lot. I mean, you've got, yeah, well, you like the Chrysler New Yorker, the Pontiac Bonneville, the Le Mans, the Chrysler Aspen, the Dodge Durango, the Chevy Tahoe. I mean, there's a lot. Let me tell you what wasn't going to win Le Mans in 65. Oh, dude. My Pontiac Le Mans. (laughs) (laughs) Or the Pontiac Le Mans that came out later. It was based on the Renault. It was the fucking Renault Le Car. But it was when they called it the Le Mans. We're now in Spec F, right? <laughs> Do they have that? We should maybe save that. Yeah, that's uh, a good we question, should probably Brian. save that one, Brian, for a later show. But it's a great question. Uh, Prashan says, if you could turn one car into a race car bed, what would it be? It'd be a fucking Dodgebon. Yeah, that or, would be or an RV. Yeah. I want the biggest bed in the world. Yeah, for sure. Winnebago, dude. A, a Dodgebon bed would be. Incredibly rad, or like a Chevy flare side truck long bed, where you have the whole cab mm-hmm. and then the bed of the truck is the is the bed. That would be like for Shaq because he's so tall. <laughs> Bro, LeBron today was tall as a motherfucker. Uh, is he what, six he's, eight or something? He's big. Like that? He's in normal. In if you see him on a basketball court, he's tall. If you see him in the real world, yep. that motherfucker is tall. And he's as, like jacked. So yeah, he's, he's just huge. an enormous. No, he's enormous. He's six yeah. foot nine. Yeah, he's a big boy. Shout out. Shout out to LeBron if you're out there. If you're listening. Worth is a and that guy carrying your jewelry. <laughs> That's I will say that. If you're uh, fucking listening to this on your G5 I mean, right now on the way to Paris or wherever the fuck you were going. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Alejandro. Oh, boy. Kind of Alejandro's long. got a lot. Okay, a lot of words here. Currently have a Prius and an E30 BMW. Um, partner had a Corolla and got rid of it. Okay. Going back to the office, and in no way am I going to sell the Prius or the E30. Wait, what? They had three cars. They what sold the one during COVID. Okay. Now they need a third car for commuting again, but they don't want to sell the Prius or the E30 to get some third vehicle. Oh, I see. So they so need two commuter cars. They need a commuter that's for for 15 to 25K. This He's a BMW fan. Okay. But maybe there's something else we should consider. Well, 15 to 25 grand will get you an amazing E46 non-M. Yeah. Like a ZHP... You know, That's a great or car. a three twenty five XI wagon would be excellent. Twenty like fifteen grand will get you the nicest three twenty five wagon yeah. automatic around. I, I would do that. E forty sixes are made really well. They are, especially they, if they don't have the complicated engine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that'll get you a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm into that. Maybe a convertible. Yeah, I, I would say E thirty six is honestly yeah. or an E forty six. Excuse me. Don't get a convertible because you said you live in SF and it'd be very easy to break into a convertible. Good point. All you need is a knife. Good point. Uh, Gunner Ray says, "Has someone ever built a hot Trabant?" While I appreciate you being a patron, Gunner, Gunner I'm pretty sure that's just something Googleable. And I bet Zach within I've thirty won. seconds can find a picture of a Trabant race car. Yeah, yep, there it is. There are many. So the answer is a whole cool. bunch of fucking people have built Trabant race cars. In fact, I think some of those photos are Goodwood. Uh, oh, man, this looks cool. <laughs> oh, the, the, the Trabant hill climb car I am yeah, definitely with, into. With fender flares. Yeah. Yes, they, I, I think Trabant might have built the Trabant race car. Wow, that Oh, that's like a... That one's got an H22 with a center engine. That's fucking cool. That's like a crazy hill climb one. Mm-hmm. I like that very much. That would sound a hundred percent. Someone a hundred percent. That I'm glad you asked us, and we may were able to make content out of that. But yes, that is the answer. Uh, Gunner Ray. Uh, sorry, uh, I, 
five MGs. Dre in Houston says, uh, "Have you? Do you have any opinions on tech art additions to Porsches? Are they douchey or tasteful? I've been eyeing some of the parts, but I'm thinking it's just money burning a hole in my pocket to spend. Tech art has both performance and cosmetic uh, aftermarket parts for Correct. Porsche. I don't really like how most of them look." I'm not saying all of them, but I don't like how most of their body kits look. But they make they have power kits that make uh, a pretty uh, like a, almost it's you can't really get it from all the dealers at least not the the but I think Porsche is su- pseudo approving of the of, of the, the power market, kits. Yeah. I mean they they were one of let's see they've just they've been around the game for a long time selling yeah. like stage one two three kits yeah. for turbos they make i think they make the power they advertise and you know so in that regard like their parts are good but a lot of their aero parts tend to be very aggressive looking and kind of tacky not age well yeah some of those euro magazines use these cars in like high speed tuner car shootouts and they mm-hmm. do okay yeah. they they perform but they're and some of this stuff like you could paint that. Yep. Not that I mind green, like we're looking at a, a green one right now, but the mixture of, it's that mixture of the carbon and the green and the painted on right. accent stripe. Like, it's just too fucking much. Yeah, a lot of it, 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 like you said, if you would paint the parts that were installed, that would do a ton to make the car. I mean, that's like, you know, roof, some of the other ones. If you paint all the body panels that are going on there, then it just looks like a wider race car, like a yeah. liveried car. But yeah. when it's just four different colors, yeah. then the modifications really stand out. Uh, Vin, um, Tim and I saw the most amazing 911 on the way down to John's thing. The license plate was GT3 Eater. Mm-hmm. Okay. This was a 997 Cabrio mm. with a huge wing on the back, wheels, kind of messed up paint on the uh, front and back. The duck spoiler on it was flat black, as in unpainted. Mm -hmm. And then the wing, the canards off the sides of the very large wing were wiggling at 60 (laughs) miles per hour. So Maybe it had been eaten. Like, maybe it's a really fast car. We didn't know. Yeah. But I have It's funny if it does like 300 in the standing mile. Right. Maybe it does. But I had a lot of questions <laughs> when I really saw that. Funny. I was like, that is that is a boastful <laughs> awesome. plate for a car that yeah, that's awesome. needs some paintwork. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, I don't... I, I Some of this stuff, uh, if in the right color, we're just browsing through it. It looks like if you paint it one color, it looks pretty decent. Yeah. But it, when, it's, when everything is like... When there's four different colors going on, it's too much. Yeah, that's... It's too, too much. much. Yeah. Uh, Caleb says, uh, I don't know if you've covered this already, but what were your favorite and least favorite cars you've owned and why? I mean, we've probably covered this at some point. Love you on Clarkson's Farm, by the way. I'll uh, I'll do the short version. I mean, favorite is, is probably my Countach. Needs no further explanation. And my least favorite was my Hummer H1, which is also the car I owned for the least amount of time. And it was like driving a school bus, Hummer H1. I almost, the Hummer H1 almost made it to my list of worst cars driven. Wow. Because my ownership yeah. experience with it was so it's terrible. terrible. Yeah, it's awful. It's awful. But it's partially my own fault for thinking it could be something that it can't, you know? It could. I also just heard that like every Chevy gas V8 that was in them had to be replaced before yeah. they went to the desert because there was a huge manufacturing defect there in was. like cylinder eight. Well, there there was. <laughs> the gas ones were worse than the diesel. Mine was a diesel. Mine also had a defect in the design, something called the PMD, which is a pump-mounted driver. And the driver was like a computer thing. Mm-hmm. It's a it was a, it's a, a chip of some kind that controlled the ignition of the vehicle, and it was as the name describes mounted on a pump, and the pump uh, uh, was um, it was the water pump, okay, right? And so while coolant was flowing, it would stay cool, okay, but then you'd shut the car off, and the thing would sit and heat up from hot coolant sitting in there soaking. And it would melt the fucking circuits. And then the car wouldn't start anymore. <laughs> what a bad idea. Yeah. And the fix was pretty straightforward. You'd move the the computer, the computer yeah. away from the pump. It right. was but it was expensive because they'd have to lengthen the wires and oh. stuff. It wasn't long. So it was something like four or five thousand oh dollars to move the thing. And I I couldn't find A, I couldn't find anybody who had worked on a Hummer H one. 
it would be easier now. The internet is a little more mature. Mm-hmm. But this was right after the Hummer dealers stopped selling them new. And when and I don't know how I called three Hummer dealers. There were three Hummer dealers in driving distance, and they all said the same thing: "We don't work on diesels." I go, but this was. Your most you expensive it. product until yeah. two years ago. What the fuck? All the techs got sent to Iraq nobody, or something. Yeah. For, nobody, I mean, wor- nobody worked on them. So between the cost of the fix and the fact that I literally couldn't find someone at the time to work on these things, I was it was a disaster. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean you have no one who can work on? Yeah. I, like this, I, I was bought like, it here. These were in the showroom two years ago. What do you mean? I bought it from you. Like, mm, <laughs> we've moved on. Sorry. <laughs> you'd probably have a, you'd probably have an easier time now finding someone to work on a Hummer yeah. H1. I mean, now they're collectible, so now it's worth doing. You know, whatever. <laughs> Nightmare. <laughs> it. Uh, I. Uh, in fairness, this like like an inch of fairness. The Alphas, which are much, were much more expensive. They're the last year, the 06s. They had the Duramax. They had the Allison gearbox. They basically had a 3500 HD running gear, whereas the one I had, which was a 6.5 turbo diesel, had a much older. It actually did have an Allison gearbox. It was a four-speed as opposed to a six-speed they got later. When they got that, they got a little better, like marginally better, but... Certainly don't ever get a gas. The gas ones were fucked. Every one of them needed new motors. Every one. Yeah. I, I heard that spec and, or stat and I was yeah. blown away. And the early 6.5s were non-turbo. Were they non-turbo or were they non-intercooled? They didn't have some. They didn't have something you wanted. I, f- I forget if where it are was, these getting shipped to yeah. Iraq. Is it hot there? Yeah, because these don't have. Yeah, I want to say they weren't turbo and it's they became the turbo winter. later, but it might have been that they weren't intercooled and got intercooled later. But it was like. It was like driving school. Turbocharged vehicles without intercoolers. I know it was for cost savings and it can kind of work, <laughs> but wow, what a variety in power you yeah, get. Yeah, this is garbage. Uh, Greg Lord. Scott, I have an Audi uh, RS3 on order. Never owned an Audi product before. Is it worth the money to do the tech pack with Bang & Olufsen speakers if I tend to listen to bass-heavy music? Uh, follow up with what's your favorite color? Um, thinking about one of the brighter options. Uh, I would say, I don't know what else comes with the tech pack. I don't, I don't remember, frankly. It's been a while since I drove it. Uh, I would say it probably is, if you can afford it. RS3s hold their value really well, and they're also really nice to drive and use. And the more options you get on them, the more they start to feel like real Audis. Mm, and not Volkswagens. And not right. Volkswagens. If you get a stripper one, especially if it's a stripper like S3, it'll feel kind of Volkswagen-y. If you get a fully loaded one, it'll really feel like a small Audi. So I recommend getting whatever options you can afford. I mean, hopefully you can sit in both, and then you'll know if what you like to listen to requires that system. Because some some cars, even with the bass stereo, like is good enough yeah. for most music. Bang & Olufsen makes nice stuff. They do. They have the, the stereo on my Ford is Bang & Olufsen. It's pretty good. I, if you like to get – it's it would be hard to upgrade the stereo later in yeah. these cars. So yep. if you think you're going to want to listen to music that sounds really good, I would just get the better stereo. Yeah. And I'd say the color question is very subjective, but I think it's easier to resell a blue car yeah. based on – Whenever I've seen a blue car and a yellow same car, like the price, there's a price difference. Yeah. I think yellow is much more particular. Uh, Christian says, now that the Malibu car show has died, where is the best Malibu cars and coffee? Um, there's smaller ones that are distributed around. There is an official Malibu cars and coffee. It might be this coming weekend. Uh, I forget if it's the second or third Sunday of the month. I don't remember, but there is there's a website for it and some social media. So there's an actual Malibu Cars and Coffee at there's a Supercar Sunday in the Valley, uh, up on the other side of the hill, and then and then other people just do smaller events. I I don't um, I still have coffee with my friends, which is the only reason I ever went to Cars and Coffee to begin with. We just go somewhere else and we don't tell anybody. <laughs> um, so my five friends, which now includes Bill. <laughs> Nice. Like Bill Bill comes to have coffee with me and Spike and Johnny and Zuckerman. And that's that's better than going to an actual cars and coffee most of the time. Um 
but it it's it's been just there's an actual LA Cars and Coffee at Griffith Park. There's one in uh, Beverly Glen. There's a variety of events in Malibu. Motoring Club throws stuff now. Motoring Club does some stuff. Uh, so there's you got, but it's individual. It's no, it's not one thing that like that that show at Bills was every Sunday. Yeah. And so there's nothing like that anymore. Usually it's a monthly thing or. Whatever. And they tend to be hosted at a business versus right. this was just like, eh, it just happens. Right. Uh, Nick Fell. Oh, we were talking about this last episode. He recently just drove an 07 V8 Vantage and Stick, and it's been living rent-free in my head. It makes me wonder about my Aston Martin, which I don't talk to about much. Um, my Aston Martin is an Oh, he basically wants an 03 owner, an update on my 03 Vanquish. So it's in Connecticut. Um, it, it wasn't. I had too many cars out here, and I wasn't driving it that much. Um, the main reason I wasn't driving it that much is because I have to take my shoes off to drive it. Because if you recall, it's converted to a manual. The pedal box on those was already very small, and now there are three pedals where there once was two. And I, I can't drive it wearing shoes, so I, I drive it barefoot, which is fine. I also drive my Ferrari and my Lamborghini barefoot. But having three cars out here that I had to drive barefoot didn't make a lot of sense. I just wasn't driving it all that much. Um, but I do still have it. It is in Connecticut. I'd probably drive it, you know, five or six days a year. But my dad uh, drives it as well. And uh, mainly locally to to the to the golf, he drives at the golf course. I just take it on fun drives because the Connecticut back roads are very nice, and I use it as my car when I go to Connecticut. And it it it's mostly reliable. Uh, there have been the 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 um. My dad sent me photos. He said it had been sitting for about a month. The tweeters, which are at the corner of the windows. The speaker tweeters, mm-hmm. they just like whatever was holding them up came. The glue like dissolved, <laughs> and so they both went thunk and oh, fell like man. ninety degrees. Really? Yeah. What year is that car? Two thousand three. I don't know if it's a common problem. It might. Uh, I just want to see the uh, see what it looks like. It has a very nice type. stereo. I can't remember who makes it, I but uh, yeah, you can see them in uh, one more to the right. Up third, third from the left, yeah, that one. It's a British car, but it's in the corner in front of where that mirror is. There, not a great. Oh, it's not this flat. Oh, that's a flat no, no. That's right. a that is an air. Uh, no, for... that's a speaker, but it's not the tweeter. The tweeter is in the corner on the door. Yeah, you oh. can see it there. <laughs> Just like bloop. yeah, and so the glue came undone and it kind of flopped down. So had to fix that. That's a bummer. Oh, and it probably needs new tires. We put tires on it. I want to say in. 2016 and it's been driven I don't I doubt it's been driven 2000 miles since then it's got about 13 or 14,000 miles on it. I love it. I'll probably never get rid of it. It's a it's a lifetime car and in general it is reliable. Like in in general it's a, it's a stout car for as little as it gets driven, but it's uh it's in Connecticut, and that's why you don't see it very often. And I don't. When I'm in Connecticut and I drive it, I almost always post pictures on Instagram because it's so pretty. It is, and it's lovely to drive. It feels kind of old. This it's got, it's got throttle by wire, but then it has really old school hydraulic steering, steering, combined with um, a a pretty heavy clutch, considering it's I'm barefoot. Uh, remember, it was originally operated by a computer, not a human. So the pedal feel was is not it's not tuned entirely for people. Although it's much much better as a stick, and it only handles like okay. It it's not it, it's great at doing third gear, fourth gear, sixty to one sixty pulls. It lo- yeah. on the freeway. It's a highway car. It it's flies, a GT car. Right. and from five to eight thousand RPM, it sounds absolutely incredible. Revs to eight. Um, it sounds awesome, and it's great for cruising around. But it's not—it's not a real canyon carving car, and that's why I sent it back. It's perfect at like seven tenths and freeway drives. And there's a highway by my parents' house, six eighty four. That's just a big straight open fucking highway, and you can wind the fuck out of fourth gear. Um, there's it a lot screams. of cops on it a lot, but you got to do a scouting run, and then you can really have, a, have a fucking go. Shout out to six eighty four. Love you. That's where we used to do mad pulls. 
back in the day. Uh, Kurt Tennant, what New Balance models do I find the most comfortable? I'm wearing um, I'm wearing a 990 V6, and it is very comfortable. The ones that are ugly are the most comfortable. The ones <laughs> that look like dad sneakers, like they have other ones that are more like the new foam, and like the ones that are like thinner and lighter. And trying to grab the younger market. Yeah, but the ones that are fucking ugly and clunky like mine, those are really the most comfortable because the cushioning is just amazing. And then I put orthotics in them. Yeah. Nathan Fallen says, what's the best way to find a good mechanic for slightly uncommon cars? Uh, context, I have a 2018 AMG GT that's recently out of warranty. Um, I mean, I would, I mean, there's plenty of cl- independent classic Mercedes you know, dealers. It's 2018 this year, like it's modern, so it's not really a classic Mercedes. I yeah, think. but I bet you could find, for instance, there's a place here that I like in Los Angeles called Culver City Motors that does late model Mercedes. Mm-hmm. Everything from the 70s up through modern cars. They worked on my R129. The guy was a, a factory master technician. And even if a place like that you know, a lot of these places that are independents where it was like a, a master tech that left to go start their own shop. So th- where to look? Forums. Mm-hmm. Never make an account and chat with people on a forum, but search a forum for a local technician. Yeah. Also, just start Googling Google Maps, Mercedes-Benz Independent Service. And then read the reviews. And then I'd say with those reviews, uh, make sure that the cars people have brought in that they are you know, posting about are – similar in age to your car. If someone's got in there with like something from the 80s only or 90s only, it might not work for you. You got to make sure they have the right computers to read your car and do all that stuff. Yeah. If you're moving near a major city, you'll find someone who can work on that car. True. 100%. Uh, just the Google to independent Mercedes Benz service and just look at the ratings and the photos mm-hmm. of their shop. Do those cars look like your car? That would be that would be one. That's a car that's that's new enough where I wouldn't have necessarily thought about looking for an independent. Yuck. Yeah, you just go. Oh, it's so new. I'll go to the so dealership. So new. I'll go to the dealer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Brad uh, Drofen, Drogan, Drofen. Uh, has says has the Safari all the things trend run its course since the 911 Dakar is now available from the factory? Could other cars benefit from the treatment? Uh, debating planning a Safari type build on my Honda S2000 since I've never seen one before. I would say to not do that. It'd be fun, but you can't bring anything with you. Uh, I mean, there's some I, listed Miatas out there that look like a good time. Sure, I think the trend in terms of like literal tense like sense like the trend has kind of died down but that doesn't mean that those car kind of cars aren't cool and fun right. when you use them and like yeah. you can still do do one and then people won't be like ew it's and it's fun for you having said that i don't think s s2000 is the right platform uh, specifically because of the lack of torque yeah true the torque when you got big meaty tires, you need more torque. Mm-hmm. The that BMW that I had with oversized tires and for all cars, it it you could tell the difference. Yeah. Same with my Porsche with my Safari. It was not as fast. And if I really cared, one of the things that Lee is doing with some of his other builds is is for people that want to go off road focused a little more is they're re gearing the cars. Yeah. Um, Because what you do when you make put the bigger tire on is it's literally heavier, so it's mm -hmm. moving more weight rotationally, but also the lev the the lever is longer. Like the tire is bigger. So that weight on the outside is putting more strain on the hub and then the drivetrain and everything else. So with having a torqueless wonder engine like the S two thousand and having to rev it out like crazy it's like it's not going to really do anything until you're at like 7,000 RPM probably. Right. Yeah. I, w- I, would, I don't think an S2000 would really. I mean, Emmy Hall has a Miata that yeah. she seems to really enjoy. Uh, I don't know if her gearing short. She's running. Um, she's building a cage right now. Like she's going to run the Mint 400 in it. <laughs> yeah. That thing's going everywhere. It's very yeah. cool. Yeah. But uh, Camaros and Mustangs are, are great because they got the torque. Yeah. Uh, the 911s, believe it or not, with the flat six, they actually do have, you know, the, the higher displacement ones, the three twos, three sixes, they do have decent torque and you can re gear them. So, uh, but the S2000 doesn't, it doesn't seem like the right car for that job to me. 
If you wanted a, a lightweight front engine rear drive car to do that with, I really think an 86 or a Porsche 944. Uh, oh, that'd be cool. Because a 944 has a big displacement four-cylinder, a little more torque. Yeah. And the and the 86 has that flat engine, which is a decent decent amount of torque. S2000, you got to zing the shit out of that thing. Put a supercharger on the BRZ. Mm. Now we have a rally car. Yeah. Uh, Miguel Flores. Okay. Um, I think yeah, a premise that is well shared. Uh, he says... Cars have gotten so fast and also so heavy and beyond what uh, humans can handle, and it's irresponsible to manufacturers to build and sell these cars to anyone. All you need is money, and and all of a sudden you have crazy power. Uh, None of these cars have any driver training prerequisites, and these idiots still buying these drive at night with their lights off. How do we address this issue? It It might have to be done through regulation. But we, as Americans, buy the biggest, fastest, heaviest thing that we can afford. It's it's like it's what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, what we can do is, in in some cases, is not accommodate them further. Like there's there's measures on ballots in various states to increase the standard size of parking spaces to accommodate so many half ton trucks that are now fucking enormous, which they should absolutely not do. I mean, you you. If someone just tries to take up fucking unnecessary space, you should not accommodate them. Um, I would like to have tiered licensing if we're talking about high performance accessibility. I, yeah. uh, me and Rob Ferretti and a whole bunch of other people, I, I think tiered licensing would be a, a very interesting thing to do. And and in order to buy a certain type of car, you have to have. I mean. Or in order to at least be legally allowed to drive a certain type of car, you have to have a certain type of thing. I mean, you could buy a motorcycle right now without having a motorcycle endorsement on your license, but you're not supposed to be riding it. I mean, I know people do, but but there is a and that is an actual crime, uh, a, a small one, but a crime nonetheless. So, uh, I think. Um, but I've I've said to people to manufacturers directly, McLaren, and. Um, uh, particularly McLaren, because their cars are so obscenely fast. Uh, You're just selling this to people? What is wrong with you? You're not making them take a course in order to drive this? And they go, well, we offer a course. And I go, but how can you not make people take a course? They go, we'd never sell a car. They wouldn't. They go, nobody wants to be forced to go into training to buy a thing. They just don't. Right. And, And so... As long as the gov the, the the businesses will not self regulate because they never do, you know there there would need to be a government intervention. Uh, and I think that would only happen is if if, if there was a huge amount of crashes happening, mm-hmm. particularly in cars that are five hundred horsepower above or whatever. But yeah, I don't. I think I don't know if I don't know if that's happening. I don't have the stats on that, so I can't say yes or no on that. But I think it's just car accidents happen, and it's like this crossover, this hatchback, this Hellcat. Like obviously, the energy in a car that has that much power could be much higher in an accident, but only depends on how fast they're going when they crash. Like, I yeah, I I I don't have any data either, but I do have an interesting anecdote. Uh, the guy I was talking to was the head of sales at the Concourse Club in Miami. And, and they get a lot of novices that join there mm-hmm. because they have a really good life, um, um, training program in-house. And so people people feel more comfortable joining there than they would going to an HPDE in their GT3 or whatever. And they all ask this guy, what car should I buy? And they have a they have BMW M2 club sports or something it's like a it's an m2 but with a cage in it that's your training car and and they they have little club races as well and they have time attacks and and they also because so many people already have them they're able to service them on site they're able to get parts they're mostly production parts in the cars and they're and they're reliable for this type of track work and he goes they get good at these and they go but here's what happens they all inevitably buy something faster but very rarely get faster Mm. They just can't drive right. any faster 
mentally, even though they have a car they can go faster and go. They keep buying, they'll go from this to a cup car to a 458 challenge and their lap times will be the same. Wow. Interesting. And and this is an anecdote from someone at a at a track club, not the street and crash data, but I think th- if I had to guess from what I've seen in the canyons, most of the time, it's it's not someone who has a crazy fast car that's driving super super recklessly. Usually someone reaches their personal limit mm-hmm. and the car may go beyond that, but they don't they don't try. Right. You know, they True. go, I'm going really fucking fast right now. The and, crashes I've seen in the canyons were people that were driving a three fifty Z, like yeah. regular cars, but it was the way they approached driving that car. Yes. The, yeah. So I mean, I agree with Miguel's point. The cars have crazy power, people aren't trained for it, but I don't know that it's causing more crashes necessarily. I actually think what's riskier is as, you know, as a new, let's see, a 2018 Mustang GT, in 10 years, let's say that costs 10 grand. Like mm. now you have 16 year olds or 17 year olds that if they've worked, you know, a summer job for a long time, they can afford a car that has nearly 500 horsepower. Mm. Whereas when we were in high school, like everything, you know, the, the fastest car in the world had 500 horsepower. So we had cars that had two or 300 horsepower. Mm-hmm. So I think the person, most people that can go out and afford to buy a McLaren probably are old enough and responsible enough they don't really want to die in it or at all because they have a job and a family and things yeah. it's when it gets handed down to like a 17 year old sure that's where I think the risk is sure um, I agree with the point and I believe in tiered licensing and I think it would be great if a company came up and said you cannot buy this unless you have training but uh, capitalism unfortunately wins there you need, you need real government inter- in- interaction intervention for that to be changed um, Sean Finney liked us talking about the Alpina B3 and is suggesting that on an upcoming show, we either find or solicit from the fans a handful of interesting cars for sale and f- f- and comment on each one. Okay, that could be interesting. I like that idea. David says, do we think the newest season of Clarkson's Farm is good enough PR for him after a self-imposed very bad last few months, or will he continue to be in bed, uh, lay in the bed he's made with comments in the press. I really liked the show. I thought the show was great. Yeah, it was good. Um, you know, Clarkson will be Clarkson. He 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 does and says edgy things that are designed to provoke people, and sometimes he gets a fucking that that gets you in trouble. Mm-hmm. That's like that's what you do. I think he did uh, make an attempt at an apology on his Instagram, which yeah. I saw, and I I. I think he probably means it. And I don't know what it's like to be British and be that involved with the royal family. That's what, like my thought is like I don't I don't understand the monarchy over there. I don't yeah. I mean I don't get it, but I also don't pay attention and I don't give yeah. a shit and it's not part of my world. So it's like for me to comment on like yeah. clearly he feels a certain way about them. Yeah. Does do other people share his thoughts? Does everyone there a fan? I don't know. So everyone in over there has thoughts, whether they're a fan or they're they hate them or whatever. Everyone's got an opinion on them, mm-hmm. whereas we kind of like don't. I don't I don't really give a shit. Yeah, I don't care. But when we went to Scotland, I don't know why my parents did this, but everyone we fucking talked to, they asked their opinion on them. I think it was right when, you know, the shit with fucking Harry and Meghan, whatever was going on, either the, his book would just come out. Which or was book, a, the first one or the second one? Did he write two? I don't know. Probably they're uh, doing whatever. So he did a fucking book, and what? Yeah. And and then it was also right before the queen died. Like the okay. queen was like sick, and they thought she was going to die. That's when we were there. The queen was at Balmoral when we when, which is where she died. When we went to do the tour of Balmoral. Anyway, everyone over there has an opinion of them, and so I don't. I don't. You know, it's. Uh, I just don't give a shit, but. You know, I think Amazon threatened to shit can him, but I think the ratings on his show are really good, and I wouldn't be surprised if they don't. 
I, be, I, I they, know. They, they publicly said they were like, we're not going to, we're going to cancel all development of future projects. Yeah. And then the show, it was like their highest rated streaming show yeah. of the I year. I wouldn't be surprised if they back, well. by the time they make it again, I don't know who, who will fucking remember. But I thought the show was, uh, again, I thought it was a, a it, it was interesting the first time. Clarkson is at his best when he's bad at things and trying to figure, fumble his way through shit. And farming is very and complicated. Farming is very hard. And, and I think, you know, he was a actually like a, a good representative of his community and his and farming. Like, yeah, I mean, it, it it helps people understand where food comes from. You mm-hmm. know, and I know there's documentaries about this and stuff, but like they don't have the reach of Jeremy Clarkson. So similar to like when I've wa- gone to a car factory and seen how the car is made, I go, this comes from people like mm-hmm. watching farming and all the things they have to deal with from the rules and regulations and you know tax benefits that come and go like environmental challenges like it's been cool to watch it's been really great to watch him get educated especially on the climate side of things because mm-hmm. he was a little bit like yeah that's not real <laughs> and then the farmer's like well we used to get more rain 10 years ago he's like oh <laughs> shit we, we need more rain so stuff yeah. like that has been really interesting to watch it's a good look yeah it's a good it's a good show and and I've watched television shows made by shitty people <laughs> and movies made by shitty people in the past like so I, I disagree with him on a, on a bunch of things, but I find his writing to be excellent, and I find his television to be entertaining. So yeah, I, I think the industry often forgives. Yeah, I, it, sometimes it takes a while, but I think Woody Allen's directing movies again, which is weird. Yeah, um, uh, Daxa just did first Moto Track Day at Sepang. All the old heads were surprised I'd memorized the layout and line from watching videos and playing Sims. Uh, would such preparation take away from the magic or of a new track, or add it? Add to it. I don't know about the magic, but if I'm going to a new track to race, you know, forget. I, I go to new tracks all the time on press launches, and they do usually a couple lead follow before they turn you loose so you learn the circuit. But if I'm going to be seeing a new track in a in competition, an hour in the sim makes my, my ramp up to that new track so much faster. Yeah, and if you're on a motorcycle, you need to know what, if a left's coming up or a right sure. or whatever, because if you get it wrong, you are way more fucked than yeah. if you're on a car. So I think it adds to it because I'm not wasting time going, which way does it go? Yeah. Which way does it go? Is this a, ooh, because that's real scary, especially if you're going, trying to go fast or if you're competing. So mm-hmm. it gets rid of that, and then you can ride it and figure out the nuance and try to go fast. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know about the. I, to me, a new track isn't like magic. I've been to enough tracks that like they're just tracks. Yeah, I mean, they're some of them are good, some of them are great, but it's it's still about where does this track go? What are the nuances? How do I enjoy it and go as fast as I can, as quickly as I can? I mean, maybe the Nurburgring could be quote magic. And they suggest you not do sims before going to the Nurburgring. Too confident. You get way too confident, and that's how you have a crash. Yeah. They, if you rent a race car at the Nurburgring, they'll ask you if you play it on the sim, and if you do, they will fucking be real nervous about you going out in the car and make you take all that insurance because they know you're gonna fuck that car up. But Nurburgring is best driven like a canyon road without speed limits. Yeah. Like at least in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and also a, a video game or a video will never show you the beauty of the track. Like when mm-hmm. you arrive at the gate of like Road America, whatever flyover they do in Gran Turismo, like even though it's very pretty, it's not the same as getting there and seeing the whole thing. Like that magic will still yeah, exist. Yeah, yeah. You mean, know, you're the, not ruining the surprise. Yeah, the experience of going there has nothing to do with the sim. The sim just gets you past the first laps of where the fuck am I going? Yes. Uh, our Bobby for under. 30K, what is a better driving experience? An R32 to R34 non-GTR Skyline or a C5, C6 Corvette? Skyline prices have rocketed in Canada since they're legal in the U.S., which have, uh, where the Corvette has remained pretty stable. Cars is mo- mostly used week- for weekend and summer driving. Under 30 under 30 only gets you an okay amount of C6 Corvette. Doesn't get you a Grand Sport, does it? Um, I doubt it. From a C6? I, don't I know. doubt it. Try. It's tough because the Skyline non-GTR is a very cool thing 
The RB25 is still very smooth. The rear-wheel drive ones still have good balance. They have nice steering. They look cool. They're comfortable. But if you're purely objective driving experience and you don't it's it's not at all about the novelty factor, the you know, you were dreaming of it in PlayStation and now you've got one, the that kind of thing. A, a Corvette's is pretty normal, but it objectively performs better than a non-GTR Skyline for sure. But I I did a video with a couple of GTTs and GTSs, whatever the 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 RB25 rear wheel drive turbo, and it's still a pretty nice fun car. It has that smooth thing. It's got a nice shifter, a nice gearbox. They're comfortable and they're they're made well for the time. Cheapest Grand Sport I can find searching anywhere. These are in uh, Texas and Tennessee. It's like. Thirty-five grand, and they, for a Grand Sport. Yeah, one uh, twenty eleven Grand Sport has fifty three thousand miles on it. It's thirty seven thousand dollars, and it goes up from there. Yeah, so kind of you know kind of expensive, basically out of the price range he said. Yeah, 30. I would say the Skyline is much more interesting, and the the C six is definitely faster. How you define better driving experience? Because so subjective. A driving experience might be that. People look at you like you're driving something cool, which they would do in a Skyline, right. but they don't do in a Corvette. There's a curb appeal to one that the other doesn't really have. And or if like, if this person has only owned, let's say, BMWs, they're very experienced with inline six sound, right. so that might not be as interesting as V8 sound, and vice versa. Yeah, like, that's a really subjective yeah. question. Both good. But. Yeah, they're both good. The 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 Skylines will be a lot older. If we're talking about weekend and but summer driving, that but they'll also feel newer than the C5 Corvette because they were felt so could advanced. Could be built better, right? Yeah. That's exactly. And 34s are fully legal in Canada, so you could get a 34 GTS. What about get? A, I'd get a Stagia. If you can, I mean, 30K would probably would not get you an R34 Stagia. I don't think not a GTR. Um. Skylines in Canada may not have the. The cachet that that they have here as well, because you got them ten years first. You could also maybe go for like a Sylvia. Sylvias are are pretty cool. Also, yeah, it's a fun thing. Yeah, can't find a stage. That's yet. a tough um, one. I wouldn't get a C five. C fives are fucking old. I mean, I had one of those a long time ago, and it was plasticky when I had it. Yeah, they're they've not. I mean. Uh, They've not held up in terms. The GTR of, feels like a higher quality, for and sure. Also, even though it, it feels like, like it's upmarket, yeah. Even though it's not, even it was older. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Actually, well, the thirty-two was older, but but um, not a thirty-three or thirty-four. But tough call, tough call, buddy. Last question, Michael Ross: Is TST returning to Pikes Peak for twenty twenty-three? Don't know. Unsure. I don't know what the date of it is, and if it if it's because it's in June, right? I don't know if the date uh, overlaps with my road and track trip. In the June smoke. 25. Mm, I don't think it does, but I will have just been on that, that trip. Uh, the Smoky 600, the road and track trip that I'm going to scout the route for tomorrow morning with Hannah, is uh, sold out, which is great. Uh, if any of you listeners are signed up, I'm very excited for that, and I'll see you in Bowling Green for the start. But uh, I don't know about going to Pikes Peak. I mean, it was fun. It was a fun experience. A lot of our friends are there. We we enjoyed it. We I mean, we didn't make money. <laughs> no. Frankly, uh, we we did we tried to do three podcasts. We tried. We did do three podcasts from there. But the the audience's appetite for Pikes Peak content does not match the opportunities for content so many people who are going to pikes peak want to tell their stories they have stories to tell they want to tell their stories but the 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 numbers suggest that uh, the audience's appetite for pikes peak content is is one episode mm -hmm. basically and it isn't worth flying all the way there to do one episode and uh, it's quite expensive to go. It's the biggest thing that happens 
the uh, the uh, for the year in Colorado Springs. So all the hotels are expensive, and 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 everything is kind of expensive. And it was a is a is a great trip. And if a sponsor would like to us to go and make content uh, that that they have covered the cost of and all that kind of stuff, then I would be interested to go back. But I don't I don't think I would like to spend my own hard earned money to go again just to work. Yeah. <laughs> It's, if I went, yeah. if I went again and was paying to go, I, it would be a vacation. I wouldn't be making fucking. Yeah, content. I don't want to go and like camp up there and have <laughs> yeah. my own schedule and you know stay on the mountain and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, uh, there's so many stories there that are interesting, but the audience does not have uh, the appetite for that many stories. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's yeah. what the data says. And don't don't email me and say that you love it and because we're talking about tens of thousands of people or hundreds of thousands of people there are even even the episodes that quote didn't do good still did 30 40 50,000 downloads so if you liked them thank you for listening we appreciate that but we need we need it was like ep- the first episode did 120,000 the next episode did half the episode after that did half of that so it dropped off. The, 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 it's not hard to follow the trend. It's a 45 degree angle down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so if you liked that content, I really appreciate it. Go watch it all again. But <laughs> but it doesn't justify multiple shows. And if you're not going to make multiple shows, it doesn't justify the cost of the trip. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wow. Math sucks. Fuck math. Wish we could just like spend money and not have to make it back Pike Peak's awesome. that would be fucking sweet I mean and if you love the content and and you can make it a vacation for yourself like I highly suggest that as a vacation yeah a it is vacation, a good vacation it's a good car vacation especially cause you can go you gotta get up early but but official th- shit ends at like 9am yeah so you could go hiking or you could do other stuff the rest of the day and I think you can drive up the road later in the day because they open it. And yeah. the day before, you can drive up it, like after practice ends. Every day after so practice ends. So you have end. access to the course, let's mm-hmm. say, which helps you immerse yourself in the experience because you can almost do like a track walk or drive slowly. Yeah. And then when they race, you go, oh, shit, I've been up there. I really appreciate it. Yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's our show. Thank you all for listening. Uh, I am off. By the time you're listening to this, I'm most of the way through the Root Scout unless you're a pro driver or a championship driver. Um, uh, I'm going to be uh, in Virginia. Why did I even just say Virginia? I'm not going to be in Virginia. I said Tennessee and Ken- Tennessee and Kentucky. That's where I'm going to be. Uh, I know why. Shout out to Louie Louie. Five MGs. It's very nice. Makes my brain a little slow, but it's all right. It's not so bad. <laughs> um, He's back. <laughs> <laughs> um and uh, yeah, I hope the route is great and tail the dragon in a. I've rented a Dodge Challenger V6. Oh yes, I have. All right, be I will, quiet. I will come back with my review of the twenty twenty two Dodge Challenger. It's not going to be a twenty three. I assure you, twenty twenty two. Curious how many miles run and how it's held up. Well, I got to do five like days and about six hundred miles in this fucking thing. So you know, have you ever been to the airport where I'm renting a car and I'm going to be got to be in it for like a while? No. I will sit in five or six different cars. Oh, really? I'll start them. I'll check for smells. I'll check for like weird shit. Yeah. So you really need to like choose your own car at the aisle type of thing. If I'm going somewhere for a day. I don't really care. As long as it doesn't smell like someone recently took a shit in it, I'm good. If I'm recent. Okay, continue. <laughs> but like if I'm going to be in a car for like hundreds of miles and I've checked tires before, I sent a car back when I was in Europe. Europe, right? In yeah. Europe I sent a car back uh cuz the tires weren't good. Uh, it was an Audi S7. It wasn't a fucking, you know, Chrysler Cirrus. But, <laughs> but yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna be going through a couple of cars, and I think it'll end up being a Challenger. You never know. It might end up being a Mustang or a Camaro, whatever else is in that GT 500 sporty category. Oh, yeah. dude, if they have a Shelby GT, I am renting that yes. shit and charging that to road and track. You heard it here first, my guy. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you for being fans. Donate blood, donate plasma, be the match.com, please. See you next week.